So, ah, uh, yeah, and it says we are live, guys. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Caliber Corner, episode number seventy. We've got some viewer requested topics going on today. We're going to talk about holsters galore, home security one hundred and one, as well as what we love to hunt and why. Just a general hunt chat in general. So, I want to welcome you guys. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the show. Let's go ahead and let the uh, panel go ahead and introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So, starting off on my ride over here, Tony, what is new in your world, buddy? Uh, nothing. Uh, it's All right. windy and cold and raining is why I'm not sitting in fucking deer stand in the woods. You got that, uh, you got that chair on lockdown? You got, you're protecting the chair? Guarding your territory yeah. around the easy chair? I, I your am. territory? <laughs> territory. <laughs> okay. I gotta remember mm. that. And this is my territory. Get out of my chair bubble. All right. So, Tony, give us an update, man. What's 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 new with uh, Early Watch? We're going to keep bugging you until you get the show fired up. Nothing Are you guys running some episodes? I'm, I'm having to make sure my internet's stable enough to run it. Okay. So far, it isn't doing well. Okay. Uh, it's kind of tough if you're just using, uh, like, DSL. I know sometimes, you don't. the connection's kind of iffy, and it can break up once in a while, so... And all right, well, you know, keep us updated and let us know if you're going to get an episode fired up or if you have anything coming up so we can find it and subscribe. I probably still aren't ain't going to get to it until after the first of the year. Yeah. All right. All right. Have you heard from Jimmy at all? Have you emailed him or called him or text him or anything? Nah. No? Oh, man, we got to get the man back. I got all sentimental when they played that footage on, on Matt's chat the other night where there was the, the Travi chat and there were, Jimmy was on that one. And I was like, man, we miss, I miss Jimmy. Got to get him back, man. Got to get him back. So, all right, man. Well, Tony, thanks for being with us today, man. I do appreciate it very much. Thanks for being here. And uh, I think uh, we're going to have a good time. So, yeah. Certainly welcome. And thanks for the invite. Cool. All right. Squib, what's going on? Our man on the street. Squib, what do you know, buddy? Uh, sorry, let me try to get to my phone here. It's in my, in my pocket. Yeah, I'm... Uh, walking home from the tire shop uh i got in half an hour after they opened and they i've never seen that many cars parked there they're up and down the streets they're all, the whole lot's full the guy said i can't get to it till this afternoon i said that's fine i got two feet so i'm getting my morning exercise yeah how far do you have to walk i'll come get you <laughs> yeah no problem <laughs> I know I told you, I was, we were joking in the pre chat that this looks like the body cam footage you watch on YouTube. So it's. <laughs> yeah, you know, you guys get to see all my hangouts. You know, yeah. there's Taco Bell. Yeah. <laughs> there's my bank. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. It kind of looks a lot like Nebraska. It really does look very similar. See some similarities there, oh, man. We got it's... more trees. We got more trees in here. Yeah, guys. yeah, probably. Hmm. Oh. All right, man. So, Squid, where can we find you? Where are you at out there on, on YouTube and GunChannels.com? Where can a person find you? Well, I've got a channel, uh, Squid Load, two separate words. It's not the first one you find when you type it in. Yeah. Uh, I don't have uh, the best quality videos, and I haven't released a video in about two months. So I'm, I'm actually working on one right now. Good, uh, good. It's not going to be that good. I've already kind of gone through the rough and i'm like man i'm just not getting any better at these but uh yeah i'm i'm working on on one right now and also i finally got on gun streamer uh thanks to obnoxious one so yeah. uh i just posted two videos over there but the same stuff i have on youtube so it's nothing nothing special you know it's still a, it's still a different audience so you got a you got a different crowd than than what you typically see in youtube which is cool there's a lot of the same people but there's a lot of new people and there's a lot of people that have been on you know gun streamer since day one which is really cool this video that's in progress, is this a Squib the Streetwalker video? No, actually, Tony, your voice might be in the background because I'm taking cuts from the lobby where uh, I was live on air shooting that deer. So, remember you and I were trash talking back and forth? Oh, <laughs> man, it's going to get rough. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm probably just going to cut out. You're definitely going to hear Pondry's voice because... Uh, you know, two gunshots go up in the background. He's just going and going and going. He's doing Ron White jokes. So I'm not sure if I want to, you know, put in a, a minute and a half uh, cut from the lobby or just like maybe a 15-second clip, probably just a 15-second clip from the lobby where you can you can hear the rifle go off. But, uh, yeah, I, I downloaded that, and, and uh, <laughs> you, you were like, uh, did you get lost in the woods? 
<laughs> it's pretty funny, Tony. So uh, I, I'm calling that uh, Gun Channel's first blind pop because I was in the blind and, and, and you know, it was live ammo. So there you go. There you go. That sounds yeah. like a uh, challenge accepted in a month here, Travis. I think so. Yeah. I think you so. You guys better be in the lobby. Oh, we'll be ready to go. We'll be ready to go. No, no, no. Uh, Have your phones charged up. Get a battery pack. That's something I bought yeah. beforehand was a battery pack, and it worked great even in the cold. Yeah. Uh, but uh, keep your phones keep your phones charged up, and uh, just jump into the lobby, and just uh, uh, we can hear we can hear your uh, activity in the background there. I don't know about the I lobby. Can hear both that'd be cool if we both just go live from like a. Oh, I can hear it right now. Be very, very quiet. We're hunting deal. <laughs> and he was pass me my wifle. You can't have my wife. No, wifle. <laughs> oh man. No, and, and you know what, Santa? Watch it. We'll love it so much. We'll end up making a show out of it or something. <laughs> oh god. Deer, Spring deer Hill chat. Shooters. Spring deer Hill chat. Shooters is sponsored by Mossy Oak Real Tree. And Deers oh, Unlimited. There you go. In the NRA. Hornet right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. munitions. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Yep, got to have all the generic sponsors. Jack Link Sausage. All right. So, Squib, thanks for joining us, man. I do appreciate it. As yeah, always, man, it's great you. to have you here. So, thanks, uh, for the, uh, thanks for the invite as usual. No problem, man. All right. Sandhill Shooter, what is new in your world, brother? How you doing, man? Oh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's just shy of 40 degrees up here. And yeah, yeah. Beautiful northeast Nebraska. I want to shout out Ronald Robertson. Looks like... Uh, we're neighbors. I didn't even know I had anybody that jumped on these chats from the same town as me. So um, that's pretty cool. I will be heading into work later today, extended holiday hours, so I don't go in quite okay. as early. So here after a while, there will probably be uh, two of me in the chat for a second, and then I'll okay. be on the road heading in. Cool, man. So if uh, we want to check out your channel, your shows, where can we find you? What should we be looking for? You can find me on the Sand Hill Shooter channel on YouTube. You can find me on gunchannels.com, guntube.org. Uh, now everything automatically uploads to GunStreamer as well, and I try to remember to throw it up on YouTube. Uh, supporters can go to Patreon and look me up, always under Sand Hill Shooter. Same thing on Facebook. Very cool, man. Very cool. All right, guys, sure check out my yeah. Cool, man. All right. Uh, David Bowling's with us. David Bowling, what's going on, man? The, the original Kingpin, is that what we're supposed to call you? Is that right? The real Kingpin? OG Kingpin. OG Kingpin. Now, David said he's got some work going on this morning, so he might uh, be joining us periodically. So, Dave, you get a chance, you jump back in, all right, buddy? All right. So, joining us, uh, I believe, for the first time as a panelist on Caliber Corner is Calaveras32 Special. Calaveras, what's new in your world, man? How you doing? Uh, you know, besides, you know, trying to dodge all the uh, idiots out here in California, you know, uh, <laughs> doing pretty well. You know, you know, I appreciate the invite there, Travis. Cool, man. So your channel, tell us about your channel, uh, any live streams that you do. What 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 work we what can we find if we go check out your channel? Um most of the stuff I've done so far has been reviews. I've done a couple of lives here and there. Just not you know, I need to try to get one scheduled as a uh, mm -hmm. regular thing, but as of this point that hasn't happened yet. Uh, okay. I try to jump in on you know what. Uh, Two A Tuesday with Sand Hills when I can. Uh, there's a few other ones periodically. You know, I get invited over by you know, you know want to unloaded media occasionally. Sure. Uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, the type of content I put up on my channel is just anything I happen to find interesting. It's not explicitly one thing or another. Uh, I've actually got you know uh, I broke it into a few pieces, but I've got some videos coming up. You know, uh, from footage I shot on a GoPro from my last Spartan run, you know, here last month. Yeah. Uh, which is a obstacle course race that I run cool. every year. But other than that, not a whole lot going on. Cool, man. All right. Well, guys, do make sure you check out his channel. And, and always, you know, make sure you guys get over to gunchannels.com. We're all over there. You can follow us over there. Uh, guntube.org, we're over there, too. And uh, last but not least, AWAG. AWAG, what's going on, man? Hi, what do you know? How you doing? And we're we're staying busy as usual. So, oh, the uh, the tactical rooster just showed up. So we'll get back to you in a sec. There, Giz. Hey, Wag, tell us about your channel. What kind of projects you got going on? What uh, is new? What's new in the neighborhood? Uh, 
is kind of boring right now. There's not much going on. Uh, I do have projects in the work in the works. Uh, I'm building a Romanian PSL that I'm currently getting footage of. Uh, instead of the 24 inch barrel uh, on the standard PSL, I'm going to have the barrel cut down to 18. So it will be a semi-automatic flamethrower, essentially. Oh my, <laughs> that is awesome. So who's do you have gunsmith that's going to do the work? Or are you going to cut the barrel down or what? Um, I don't have a lathe in order to cut the barrel down, so mm -hmm. I'm going to send the barrel out to get cut down. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a local shop here uh, in South Jersey. Um, I'll have more details about that later. But um, yeah, so after the chat today, I'm going to go to the range and hopefully get footage of me shooting the uh, M72 RPK that I built a while back. So stay tuned for that. Other than that, thank you for the invite. Cool. No, man, it's always great to have you here. Uh, I wanted a way to do the uh, attendance because we have so many people that join in the, the show, you know, a couple minutes after we get started. So let's give a little recognition to the people that are joining us here. Let's see. What's, well, I, I don't know. Midnight Range is, is all, Midnight Range, I, I sent you an invite this morning, buddy. I guess I don't invite you, huh, Pickle? That's it. We're over. Oh, man, I don't know. There sounds like we got some divorce plans there. Uh, Richard Chamberlain's with us. Sketchy Roll's with us. Tacos and French fries in the house uh sand hill shooter there and here rich white again gasper Ajnik is with us uh stephen dawkins ronald robertson again uh good morning from nebraska to you too sir uh tt mama 502 in the house patrick g's with us uh gm tools cadillac jack calaveras is there and here stan goldman is with us good morning stan how you doing stan thank you for the t-shirt man i do appreciate it always love any kind of uh firearms related clothing i can get my hands on uh, sketchy rolls in the house. John Brown Productions is with us. Scott P79, and the first person checking in is Two Live Moo. And then let's go on over to the uh, Gun Channel side and see who's with us over there. Tony was over there right now, and we've also got Paper Plane Crash in the house. Sand Hill Shooters over there too. Ohio 45 ACP looks like you're online, so hopefully you're watching this also. So again, uh, the, the the topics for today we have not had a holster chat for about six months, and the uh, the holsters that that I, that I use that I carry. Um, have changed quite a bit. I, I've really, I used to just do straight up standard hard shell Kydex. This is a Klinger Stingray V3. Uh, just kind of what I used was the Stingray series, but I mean, I've changed quite a bit my outside the waistband holster, holsters, inside the waistband holsters. So just kind of uh, some preferences. Do you guys have any, any good recommendations for an outside the waistband holster? And again, I know that there's probably going to be uh, maybe some jokes going on about, well, you shouldn't have this holster, that holster, because it's cheap or whatnot. But it's kind of interesting when I do holster reviews, the reactions that I get from people, there are some where people say, why would you use that? You know, that holster's junk or, oh, that, that's a great one. So I just kind of want to run it through the room here. Tony, what, what is your preference for a holster? And I know we had, you know, we'd had this discussion six months ago, but again, these are all, you know, viewer requested topics. So Tony, I, what do you uh, think? Yeah. I do not do outside the waistband except for hunting. And I just do a bulldog for that. And I, carry my iwb with the, just a bulldog that i've had for years yeah yeah and the reason i like it is because it bends with you when you sit down it's soft yeah yeah because it's not sitting there poking in you the whole time especially if you're trying to drive or you're trying to uh you know do anything where you're, you're more than upright essentially yeah uh and i'm completely happy with the thing so yeah yeah Cool, cool. I do apologize, guys. I'm just making a few little adjustments. I got a new webcam here that we're using, so it's going to take some time to get used to it. So, yeah, so, you know, you don't have to uh, break the bank when it comes to a holster. You can just get with whatever's going to work best for you. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on it. Uh, one of my favorite ones, and again, we can all laugh, Uncle Mike's, right? Got it at Walmart. I use it with multiple guns. This is just my range holster. Uh, if I just want something simple or comfortable to throw on, I don't even have a strap over the top. I just drop the gun in. And take it with me you know these are 15 bucks it fits multiple firearms it does a really good job you know if you don't want to you know you can just go pick up something local at walmart and things like that so uh so will, what about you will, oh go ahead Tony. Hey, yeah i said i will add one thing you want to get a, a thumb brake holster mm -hmm. you're carrying iwb because oh, that's yeah. the only damn thing open <laughs> true true well for inside the waistband i mean if you've got uh Kydex going on, you've got the natural retention or the adjustable retention that you can use too. So, I mean, it's not like you have to have a any kind of a strap going over the top of the firearm. Well, there's no adjustable retention on uh, Uncle Mike's or Bulldog. 
Yeah, this is true. This is true. But I mean, if you've got the strap over the top with the Velcro, you can make it tighter. You can make it uh, looser if you want to over the back of the firearm. I just don't have the strap on that one. I suppose you could cinch up the belt tighter, I reckon. True, true. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, that would definitely work out well for you. So, again, for uh, recommendations, Tony's had good luck with the uh, the Bulldog holster, so that's definitely one to check out. Only right. holster I own is an Alien Gear Shapeshift. Uh, that's where I currently have it set up as an outside the waistband, just because, you know, uh, when I've been out shooting with buddies on uh, family on his family's farm and whatnot, I carried it out there just so I had it with me because I was practicing with it a, a bit. Um, as for is it the best thing out there? No idea because it you know uh, I don't have anything to reference it against. But yeah, it seems to work just fine. It you know, uh, bolts close to the, you know your body so it doesn't get caught on stuff. It has the ability for a level three retention if you want. Uh, I don't know. I chose it just because of flexibility. It gave me some I could experiment with it a little bit and figure out what I liked. Mm -hmm. That'll work out well for you. Uh, we do have a super chat already from Boob Sweat. Uh, what does everyone think of Savoy leather outside the waistband holsters? Guys, do you have any experience with that brand or are you guys familiar with that brand at all? I mean, there's so many different brands of holsters that are out there. I'm not. I, my dad has one for Kimber. Uh, I, I guess it's okay. I've never really, you know, I'm not a concealed carry person, so. Yeah. But I mean, like with your dad's, I mean, the fit and the finish has been good. It's broken in well. I mean, it looks yeah. nice. The, everything is decent. You know, again, you want to you want to do some maybe asking around a little bit at the gun shop or just do some read online and see what they what they put into the actual production of it. You know, what grade of leather are they using? Do they double stitch it? What you know, if they've been around for quite a while, there's there's a chance it might be a decent uh, a decent company to go with. You know, when it comes to the the leather holsters too. I mean, you can spend a lot of money. You can spend as little as say fifty bucks, all the way up to you know whatever you want, hundreds of dollars on it. Uh, especially if you get something that's custom made for for your firearm. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I asked for that. I mean, so 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 boob sweat. There's an answer for you. Somebody that actually has some experience with it. So you know, check into it a little bit. See what their return policy is. If they let you send it back after thirty days, and if you're not happy with it, uh, do send it back. If it's because you know nothing's worse than picking up a holster that that's just not going to work for you. You know, you don't want to go with something that's just gonna gonna give you issues. You're gonna spend a lot of money on. It's just not gonna work. So obviously, you know, uh, Squib, do you have any preferences in holsters at all? What do you like to go with? What I like is probably really unpopular. Big surprise yeah. there, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, I like. Hey man, whatever Mil works, you know. I like military issue flap holsters. Okay. Oh geez. Okay, he got <laughs> me. He got me scared there. I thought he was gonna say something else. Uh, to walk in the footsteps of a Navy SEAL. Oh yeah, there you go, urban carry. Uh, no, no. I haven't carried. Uh, I haven't carried concealed in eleven years. Uh, yeah. You know, people say, "Oh, flap holster, you can't draw fast, dude." I don't care if you gave me a speed rig; I can't draw fast. So <laughs> for me, you know, for me, uh, I'm just I'm not Bob Munden, okay? So. Um, for me, it's about uh, retention, protection. Uh, it's it's about uh, whether I'm carrying it while I'm walking the dog or whether I carry it while I'm hiking. It's not getting scuffed up, scratched up, things like that. Um, for what I carry a sidearm for, if I have to pull it that fast, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to end up a, a casualty. Uh, it, you know, if 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 I'm uh, for 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 me for what I do, if I need. Uh, to, to be on the ball with a firearm, I'm already going to have a long gun at the ready. So, uh, now, concealed carry is a little bit different, but you're talking about outside the waistband, right? Yeah. 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 This is just so, yep, yep, yep. For outside the waistband, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's it. Uh, for the kids out there, us. Go ahead, for, the, for the kiddies out there, Bob Munden is a guy who used to be, before he passed away, one of the fastest some bitches I ever saw and accurate. He held the world record for a long time, didn't he, for the fastest draw? I think so. And he could pull the gun, shoot it, and hit what he wanted to, too, that damn fast. I oh, saw him I, as a kid. That dude's awesome. I saw him hit a balloon at 600 yards with a snub-nosed 44 Magnum. Oh, my God. What? 
Six hundred yards, man. That's like tall tale yep. stuff. Seriously? Nope. I, I can't imagine what his holdover would have been, but yeah. Well, that, uh, that's probably like a uh, at least a three-story building uh, height or more. How long was the barrel? It was a snub nose, but how long? Oh, uh, two inch, three inch, whatever. It was, it was a short barrel, forty-four Magnum, Jeez. and he hit a balloon at six hundred yards with that thing. Yeah, that's that's easily like, a, like a, a three or four-story building. Probably like a hot air balloon, or like. He, he, he must have lobbed it in there, but you got to imagine how many thousand shots did he do before he got to where he knew where his holdover was. I mean, because I mean, uh, balloons, what, 10, 12 inches, you know? Elmer Keith dropped an elk at 600 yards with the 44 Special. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's see, good. that's the thing. Today, this is why I catch so much crap over the whole optics thing. Back in the day, people didn't have optics. They, they weren't available, they were, there, there weren't as many, they weren't as advanced, and they, they, they were kind of out of reach. So people had to use iron sights. And you can, and they, they didn't have all this fancy ammunition and all this other stuff. Today we've got a technological advantage over that, and with optics and, and modern munitions and things like that, we can really, really uh, amp up the game. But it is actually possible, with enough skill and enough practice, to, to do some of these shots. It's not practical. I mean, you're talking about a lot of time on the range. You're talking about a lot of ammunition. You're talking about, but I mean, it's just like what they taught us in the military. We're doing headshots at 500 meters with iron sights. And the people are like, oh, 5.56 five, isn't lethal at 500 meters. Bull crap. You know, but once again, it was a different time and a different. So all I'm saying is, even though the, the modern thing is to use optics and modern munitions, well, modern, yeah. modern bullets and stuff. It's still possible. Well, the, the thing about this, very valid point there, Squib. That's where it's the level of practice and proficiency. Nowadays, uh, there's a lot of guys that they want to buy skill. Mm -hmm. They want to, you know, uh, they want to buy abilities rather than go out there and spend days on the range and thousands of dollars in ammo practicing. Well, yeah. you you all start start thinking back in you know the day of you know early 1900s, whatever. They had rifles ranged out to 2,000 meters. Yeah. And with a basically round nose, really heavy projectile that doesn't cut the wind. And yeah, you know, you're not going to, you're going to lob it in there at 2,000. You want, you know, mass them on mass. But pe people are hitting shit at 1,000 yards. Sorry. Hitting <laughs> stuff at 1,000 yards. And with a, a bullet that is basically ballistically um, um, efficient as a rock going through the air. And, and now with all the spitzer bullets, like, yeah, let's say you do have someone that has a uh, open sight, something, but they, they'll stick a high ballistic coefficient uh, round in there, push it real fast. Well, back a hundred years ago, well, a little more than that because they had spitzer bullets a hundred years ago, but they had a Round nose, two hundred and forty grain something moving at twenty two hundred feet per second, and you just got to hold over and go. See, it's it's like this. I, I'm not being critical of people who want to buy accuracy. If you've got the money, and that's what you want to do, or you don't have the time to to practice, because that's my that's my biggest that's my Achilles heel. I just don't have the time. I know what I'm capable of, but I haven't got, gotten back to that level of proficiency because I haven't put the time into it. So I, I don't have a problem. Anybody who thinks I have a problem with that, I don't. But when you want to poo-poo some of the fundamentals because you think that's just old and antiquated, like my flap holsters, you know, it's, there's, there, was, there was a time where you couldn't buy accuracy. So that, that's all I'm saying. Flap holster aside, Squibby, I agree with you on that. A person is a fool if he doesn't learn to use open sights at least somewhat yeah and that's what i'm going to work on today is i have an ar-15 that i specifically put iron sights on it just so that i can practice with the iron sights and i have an ak that's has only iron sights and has no optics rail so i'm forced to use iron sights i'll tell you something that a lot of people don't realize is if you have a optic on scope especially and it's fairly high magnification, it's very hard to find a moving target in it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and that's what I like to do with the range is I sit out at a hundred yards, even with my little 22 bolt action that has a scope on it. Uh, I put golf balls on, um, on string and I vary the length of string depending on how far the, um, how far the distance is. And when I hit it, it moves back and forth and bounces around and things like that. And I have to, um, basically learn how to time it properly for when, uh, the swing is in that perfect position to take the shot. You know? So I'm going to try doing that today with my AR, uh, with open sights. Cool. cool. I used to practice shooting clay pigeons thrown off a thrower with a 22. Uh, and it was just something that my grandpa and my uncle kind of insisted on before they would take us hunting with them. He said, you get to where you can hit at least half of these, you ain't going hunting. <clears throat> and, I mean, it's motivation to, <laughs> to want to practice, huh? motivation to want to be more proficient. Uh, they'd let us go hunt anyway, but we wouldn't be able to carry a gun. Yeah. I well, didn't anyway, mean to change the subject. It's just, you know, once you start talking about Bob Munden, he's one of the greats. So no, anybody man, out there who's never that. heard of him, just Google him, look on YouTube, and you, you'll see some of the stuff. Yeah. And, and he said his inspiration was, um, oh, crap, I can't think of that guy's name. He had uh, a guy that they used to do exhibition shooting. Oh, man. Oh, God, I, can't I, think. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, he had those clunky old Smith & Wesson revolvers, and he was doing trick shots. And it's on, it's on old black and white film when it was all, you know, kind of grainy and scratchy. I can't think of the guy's guy name. Used to, is that the guy that used to take his twenty two rifle and – and shoot pictures with it? Uh, might have been. I've only seen the guy, I've only seen footage of the, the Bob Munden's inspiration uh, shooting revolvers, but. I was I was just reading an article in the, the back page of shooting times. I don't know what month it was that I was going back through the last year of shooting times, but they brought that guy up and, and uh, that sounded pretty that cool. That may have been Munden. No, it wasn't Munden. I would have recognized that guy. He, he retired in 1960, whoever this guy was. So he could have been Munden's inspiration. Like to kind of fall back on, on the level of proficiency with, with this kind of shooting. Like I, I never even heard of this. This is new information to me uh, to have that level of knowledge and proficiency of a specific firearm to be able to pull off shots like that is just incredible to me. Well, now <laughs> in all fairness, some of these, were done with shot rounds, you know, instead of bullets. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I don't think Munden did that, or the guy that Scribbs talked about is his influence. And, and I mean, if you look at somebody like Tom Knapp, okay, he used to say he did uh, 50, he shot 50,000 rounds a year with a shotgun to stay proficient. Now, I don't know if that included his ex exhibition shots, because he's traveling all over doing exhibition shots. And, uh, I mean, for some people, 50,000 rounds. A lot. Yeah. I mean, money-wise. But he had sponsors, though. That Munden yeah. inspiration, dude, didn't he go? Wasn't his wife a good one, too? I can't remember. That sounds like the guy I'm trying to think of. She used to hold a potato in her hand, and he'd shoot it off of her hand. Okay, we're not talking Annie Oakley. We're talking about one generation. <laughs> past this yeah, is somebody yeah. in the 20th century. Top of wines. There you Those go. Those husband and wife shooting, you know, exhibition team. Is that one you're talking about? That's well, who I'm talking about, yes. I didn't hear what you said, Calaveras. You know, uh, the Topper Wines. It was a husband and wife exhibition shooting team. That's the only one I can think of that was a pair. Could have been. I'm going to Google search it. I was just going to say real quick, if uh, we're talking about Munden, we're talking about Tom Knapp, Byron Ferguson was another one with his longbow. Yep. No yep. sights on his bow, just a traditional longbow. Um, I don't know if the show is still on, but there used to be a show on Outdoor Channel called Impossible Shots. And I'm sure you could YouTube that or look it up and find old episodes of Impossible Shots. But uh, it was cool because guys like Munden would set – this trick shot up and I don't know that they showed you every shot that they missed, but they'd show you how hard it was. And they would show some of the misses 
before they got their their money shot they were looking for. So Impossible Shots was a cool show to watch. That's how pretty sweet. So that's kind of like the the dude perfect the, where they do all those crazy trick shots, but they don't really show how many times they mess up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bring us back to our topic. I got sure. to say that I do not use uh, OWB holster hardly ever. I always carry IWB except when I go hunting. Uh, you know, because you were asking about outside holsters and that's yeah. not what I'm describing at all. It can be, but I don't use it that way. It's too damn flimsy for that. Sure. I gotcha. <clears throat> well, moving down the line, uh, Sandhills, what is your preference for holsters? What what experience have you had with different brands and what, what do you prefer to do outside the waistband, inside the waistband? What do you think? Are we covering both or just the outside right now? No, we can just, we'll just do both. We'll just go ahead and throw both. What, what works for you? Um, I've tried several. I've got that proverbial dresser drawer full of holsters right now. Yeah. Uh, the first, the first ones I tried were, uh, uh, I, I've got a sticky holster, which is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I know other guys. Oh, it's freezing up. And I carried alien gear for about a year and a half. And then this summer I wanted, I wanted to be, cool because you know there's a lot of people poo pooing the alien gear as a gimmick holster so i thought well what the heck i'll try a couple of these kydex brands i i had a a couple different ones and it's a video i haven't shot yet but i think i'm just going to make a comparison and just kind of do an honest review after trying three of these but the only one that that i actually really like out of the ones i tried was the the bravo concealment it's not bad um i've got outside and inside both but honestly, I find myself gravitating back towards the alien gear just for the sheer comfort. Okay. Um, which is what I have on right now. And uh, as far as outside the waistband goes, the Bravo is decent if you spend the extra money on the pancake loops. And if you put them on backwards from the way that the picture shows you or the videos I'll show you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you set them, because the, there's an offset on those loops. And uh, if you set it to where the offset sticks out behind the holster, then I don't think that they get they suck it any any tighter than just the regular loops that come on it. But if you okay. flip those around and put them basically backward, the logo's facing you. Um, but then that offset kind of sucks right up to where um, that the the loop is is in line with the the frame of the holster. Then it'll actually suck down tight and it's pretty concealable under a t-shirt or something like that um the shield's pretty easy to conceal the the glock yeah. 19 not quite so much yeah but i find myself gravitating back to my first outside the waistband which is a blade tech total eclipse okay and i find that carries just as close it's about even on price bravo might be a little cheaper if you watch the sales but blade tech total eclipse is a it's a good holster it comes in the box you can set it up left or right handed you just you know screw the little the little loops onto it um it's got the little the little deals that come with it so you can you can put a little bit of a forward cant to it if you like that it also comes with iwb clips in the box with it so you can run it inside the waistband or outside the waistband but i've never done inside with that one okay but i i like the bravo and i like the the blade tech um it feel <laughs> it's it's injection molded. It's not Kydex, so it feels kind of maybe like it's not you know as as high quality. But it's man, I've I've beat these things up. I've I've had I've had them for a couple of years now, and and uh, they don't show anywhere. So it's tough stuff. Yeah. yeah. Again, if you watch sales, you can get them for fifty, fifty five bucks. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, especially lately with holiday sales going on, everything's on sale between now and Christmas, basically. Yeah, <clears throat> if you look around online when it comes to just different deals and what's out there and what a person can find. Yep, exactly. Cool, cool. All right, so we're going to go ahead and let uh, Gizzard Gary introduce himself, and then Gary, you just go ahead and lead into your favorite holsters. What do you like to do? What works for you, bud? Well, uh, thanks for the invite. Um, yeah. Check out my stuff at gizzardgary.com. Uh, I'm going to be a little different than everybody else here, as wouldn't be a surprise you to anyone. You don't say. I'm sorry? 
You don't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the bird. In the bird. The times that I carry OWB are typically either inside the house or when I'm going back and forth to work. Reason being, when I go back and forth to work, I have to leave my gun in the car. So I need a holster that I can take off and stow away. So I typically gravitate toward a paddle holster. And I use, and this probably won't be the most popular choice in the world, but I usually use a Phobos paddle holster. And I had pretty good luck with the last one I bought. I've, I own three of them. One of them does not work very well. It has way too much retention on the gun. That's for my Model 85 revolver. But the one I bought for my Glock 42, it has the adjustment screw. And I've had pretty good luck with it. It Now that I've got a decent gun belt, I bought one at Wanamaker. Mm -hmm. So I can securely... That makes a lot of difference. All the difference in the world as far as stuff like paddle holsters go. Uh, but uh, that's what I use. You can put it on. It stays put. But you can also get it off fairly easy if you need to. And... Uh, that's my experience with OWB. I've got the cheapy ones, like the ones that they talk you into buying. At least the first few times I bought a gun. You know, the Uncle Mike's and the Bulldogs. They never feel right to me on waste. Yeah, so yeah. I quit buying those. But that's what I do. You know, it's something for a lot of people to start with. Something fairly inexpensive. And then and then they go from there. So, yeah. Cool. But the Focus is, they're not real expensive either. And a lot of people don't like them. They're not the greatest holsters in the world, but they're functional. They'll work. Cool, man. Cool. All right, good. Uh, let's go ahead and take it back a little ways here. We got a, we got a, there's been an outlaw sighting in the panel. So, uh, Ellis, good morning. Why don't you go and give us a little intro and share your holster knowledge with us, man? What's going on? Uh, how? Howdy. How's everybody this morning? I'm sitting at work about to uh, clock in here in a few minutes. Uh, nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you prefer for holsters? What what works for you? Outside the waistband, hey. inside the waistband, what do you do? Uh, oh, um, go ahead, Tony. I just wanted to say Hatfield and knowledge is an oxymoron. Oh, geez. <laughs> now, now, who works at the greatest gun store in the world, Tony? Come on. He does. Scoreboard, bro. Scoreboard. <laughs> No, but, but when it comes when it comes to carry holsters, I'm strictly outside the waistband. I do not do inside the waistband. That's just a hassle I do not want to have to deal with. Uh, now, are you are you in an environment? Not just talking about work, but in general, out and can you can you outside the waistband carry and not cause a scene? Will people not freak out if they see you walking around with a firearm on your hip? People don't the gun store. No, I'm talking about outside of work, outside in, in your neighborhood, in the town where you live, and stuff like that. Is it common? I, I have I have walked around with that GP100 on my hip. Nobody notices. Okay. Cover it with a t-shirt. Yeah. People are oblivious. People are blind. Unless you're somebody that's actually looking for somebody that's carrying, you're not going to notice. Yeah. Like yeah. most of us carry do. You know, it's. To to the to the average Joe out there, you see somebody, you know, they got a wrinkle in their shirt. That's what they notice. They're not looking for the printing. They're not looking for this. Not looking for that. And that's what I tell people here. You know, you're 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 so concerned about somebody noticing your gun, unless like unless in South Carolina, it's illegal to open carry. Period. You have to conceal carry. What they consider keel, concealed is the gun is covered. What about the bottom of the holster if that part is exposed or the bottom of the barrel? No. No? Okay. Okay. I mean, they can get technical and get you on something stupid, but no. Well, just... Think about it for a minute. If you're, you're, at, you're at a store, Walmart, Home Depot, whatever, and they don't have a little sign up on the door that says no Glocks allowed. Thank God I wasn't carrying Glocks. Um, and you reach your hand up to get something off the shelf, your shirt rises up, the bottom of the holster is seen. You know, somebody might decide to panic. And laws that, that call that brandishing is crap to begin with. Yeah. Illinois did a clever idea when they did our concealed carry law, and they said concealed or partially concealed, and they left it really vague. That's good. You know, what is partially concealed? Uh, 
the butt sticking out of the gun so I don't have to put an overshirt on it or what? Yeah. Well, I think that's good because there have been people that have been arrested that I've heard about. I don't know. Maybe it was in California. Calaveras, you might want to chime in on this. But there were people that have, you know, lifted up something or their shirt blew up and, you know, wind or whatever. And their gun was there and somebody saw it and freaked out and, you know. Yeah, that's where uh, if you run into one of the uh, cops that have nothing better to do. If your cover garment pulls tight and silhouettes over yeah. the gun, that can be considered brandishing in this state. Oh my god! So much for me wearing tactically tight Under Armour T-shirts, huh? Jeez, now you know why I don't. <laughs> I'm so, so, so question. Uh, so if you carry an outside the waist holster, the gun, the holster itself covers part of the gun. Does that count? I don't know. I don't have the balls enough to try that one out. Okay. I, I mean, I do on the second. I'll do it tomorrow. But I really don't go out making a spectacle of it because I'm not sure how legal it is. I'm just curious about partially concealed. Whose discretion is that up to then? Is it up to an officer that was... I, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to get arrested even if I'm in the right, you know? You're right. Yeah. Yeah, when they're vague like that, it's it's it sucks when it's open to it open to interpretation. So I mean, there's so many ways that that, that could go. I mean, it, anybody else sad and a little angry mm -hmm. that we're having the discussion of how is it uh, what's legal and what's not to exercise a right that the Constitution guarantees? You know, furthermore, in all these crime videos I've watched, I don't think I've ever seen a bad guy walk in with a gun on his hip and then draw it. It's been stuffed in a pocket, a hoodie oh, pocket course. in their hand. I've never seen somebody outside the waistband carrying that's other than like movies you know you don't ever see that so why would somebody panic if you've got a gun on your hip i mean if you're going to go do something stupid with a fire you're not going to take the time to put the proper belt on and position that holster properly and then go do your crime i mean it makes no sense whatsoever you know it's that well you're talking about hollywood now and you gotta yeah. how many hollywood movies have you seen where they don't even use a holster they just yeah, stuff it down their put that gun and, anyway where does it where yeah. do they put that you know well, yeah, my exactly. conceal, but my that's conceal Hollywood. carry holster, uh, my conceal carry holster cost me thirty five hundred dollars. Okay, it's the trunk of my car, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. So I got to put it in a case, lock it up, and put it in the trunk of my car, in order to, to carry my firearm anywhere outside my house. But in yeah. fairness, that holster never prints. All right. Must <laughs> <laughs> have stickers or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to the to the holster discussion. Foos, what works for you, man? What what inside the waistband, outside the waistband? What do you do, Foos? And, and competition wise, what do you use for competition? I'm kind of curious about that. Okay, so everyday carry, um, I just carry it in my hand. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I I actually uh, I've 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 gotten away from carrying as much uh, because I, I I normally don't go a whole bunch of places. Um, I I do. I do have a. I don't. I don't know who makes it, but it is a pancake style holster that has that I've went out and I've I've bought belt loops that are they kind of look like a P. Um. So the belt loop goes totally through the hole and it's full kydex because I did have a a. Uh, you know, I was practicing drawing from ceiling few, several years ago where. I drew and the holster came out with the gun. Mm -hmm. So I got belt loops because you know, this is on a different firearm or a different holster, but belt loops that are mechanically won't like I to take the holster off. I have to remove the belt. Um, so that's why I carry whenever I do carry uh, for, or I do have a soft sided, um, holster that I could toss my revolver in in a pocket. Okay, um, I do have that. Um, as far as um co competition, I use a Blade Tech holster, um, with a double alpha, very very rigid. Uh, it's an inch and a half belt. Like with the gun. If you take and you strap it down and everything, you can hold one side of it and the belt stays rigid. It won't collapse on itself. Okay. Um, 
yeah, that's it. I mean, Blade Tech is is good. They're they just work. I, I've ran that holster for several years. It's all dinged up, dirty inside. So I just put a gun in and go. Um, of course, we don't worry about retention or anything like that. If I go running with this, with you know, let's say you know I'm at a range, and I need to go run a hundred yards. My hand is on the gun because if I don't, I'll get there and the gun won't won't be there. So that, that is a different thing with uh, yeah um, competitions is uh, we don't care about retention unless you're at a three gun or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was gonna say for the three gun, it has to hold it upside down. You have to be able to shake it and it can't fall out. So that's right. you know it's a little bit different setup, but with, with what you what you guys are doing, yeah, I get it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. Uh, so, David, do you have an outside the waistband holster just for carrying the gun around the home or wearing it around the home? David, what do you do? Yeah, I got a uh, I got a couple different holsters. The one that I used to practice around my house came with the uh, Beretta APX. Yeah. So it's an outside the waistband holster. Whenever I practice. Uh, conceal carry i just kind of go you know old school and stuff it in my pants or put it in the pocket because i don't have a concealed holster but i use the beretta apx i guess factory holster when i practice around my house to open carry okay okay and it seems pretty good i did try <clears throat> that uh one of the guys that i watch uh jesse b outdoors does a lot of holster reviews and he was showing how you hold the gun upside down and shake it and this one, the Beretta holster, if you shake it, it comes right out of there. So I don't know if, if for whatever craziness happens in Maryland eventually lets me carry, I'll probably go with some type of custom holsters for my, for my pistols because I don't want them to fall out. Does it have the little adjustment screws on it so you can tighten the retention on it like that? Yeah, it does. And I plan on practicing, you know, tightening the screws and loosening the screws this weekend. Getting it the way you Just, want it, yeah. Yeah, just to see if I can tighten up on the retention a little bit, but it's it it comes in and out really nice. It's easy to draw from. It's easy to put back in. So a lot of these custom holsters and stuff like that. Third, I have I have a friend of mine. He makes he makes one off holsters. I mean, you order it, he'll make it by hand. Um, thing is, it's you don't if it's if a holster in today's market is more than $60 paying too much. You're paying for a name. You're paying for something you don't need to be paying for. Unless we're talking about like a cowboy setup where you've got a nice full size, yeah, yeah. big revolver, you got dual or, you know, cowboy yeah, I, I, shooting. I, I, I'm, talking, know, I'm talking, I'm talking full, yeah. full Kydex, yeah. no leather, just, I mean, $60, you're, Honestly, it should be closer to thirty, but you know. Yeah, the the clingers that I buy, the ones that I bought in the past, the, these are thirty five dollars, I think, or something like that. Thirty five bucks, yeah. thirty five ninety five, and there's sometimes free shipping. So that's yeah. You know, I, you I, actually, on eBay, there's a lot of smaller for people that produce holsters that are on eBay. They're selling them for twenty bucks, and they're mm -hmm. they're custom made, and they're not Chinese imports. These are people that have small shops on. Because you look, that's a great place to look for holsters, especially if you get a gun. And there's no holsters around for it. If you go on eBay, there's a good chance that somebody out there makes one for it. Yeah, because or I mean, can. because yes, like the machine to make a holster is not not crazy expensive. It's not cheap, so they do have to make their money back there. But the piece of Kydex, you're looking at maybe two two dollars worth of Kydex in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're really paying for the person's time, and mm -hmm. that's that's the big thing of it well and you know you're buying something that's going to last potentially a lifetime you know i mean it, it just you know that's that's part of the part yeah. of the price also is what you're getting is the whole package when it's all said and done right and, uh, and, and people are like you know I, you know i don't want to scratch or whatever it number one if if you're carrying a gun that you were scared to scratch or get dinged up you're carrying the wrong gun yeah or you or you don't Maybe you're carrying the right gun. Your mindset is just wrong because think of it as as a truck. I know people are going to be like, oh, I don't want to scratch my truck up, but it, it's it's a vehicle. It's made to be used. used. 
it's going to rust and fall apart at some point anyway. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. It's all unbeatable. They're, they're tools. They're, I can get if it's a collector car or if it's something exclusive or it's your weekend ride, you know, but yeah, for the average person, just use it. You're going to lose the resale on it anyway. If it's your everyday carry gun, then yeah, it's going to get beat up. But if you've got that really nice, you know, nickel plated uh, 1911 or, you know, uh, uh, m9a3 or something you know that's a little more expensive and you want to carry it every now and then it's kind of like having that corvette in the garage that you take out every now and then you know when when you know you're going to be careful with it and you're not going to be uh taking it through the rain or anything then it's okay every now and then you're just going to be extra careful that day that you don't scratch it up but but well no no then but but the thing is let's say you want to take it out you want to take this corvette out let's say you know, next Sunday, you're like, oh, man, it's supposed to be nice. I want to take it out. Let's do this. You wake up that Sunday, and it's piss pouring rain. Guess what? That Corvette's staying in the damn garage. Oh, absolutely. And, and so, you got to so, be prepared. So, that so same with the gun. And then if something happens and you're out driving that Corvette and a deer runs in front of you, <laughs> I buy a Corvette. You have to think about the same thing. Exactly. About a firearm. Yes, but that's for uh, as for you know that it is your carry piece. It is you know, uh, yeah. I think you know having the understanding that something can potentially happen is necessary. But don't you know? Uh, don't pull a Jaeger and intentionally chuck it just so you can put a few dings in it. You know, uh, to prove it's a tool. Yeah. You're gonna gonna drop try to with some kind of respect. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not one that tends to buy guns to look at you know now i've got a number of revolvers that are very pretty and rather costly and each one of them have a ding or something somewhere uh because i bought the damn things to use well i'm, uh, I'm the same way tony calaveras likes to make fun of me for having a glock but in all reality i bought it because i knew the reputation that glock had and i didn't buy it because it's pretty and it's it's held up its end of the deal it goes bang every time i pull the trigger and if i do my part it puts them exactly where i'm aiming it too so if it gets dinged up it's a glock or my shield you know it's i paid 349 plus some tax for that thing so it's it's not like i've got a ton of money wrapped up into my carry guns if i ever do get my uh my beretta m9a3 that i want to get it might not ever be a carry gun it's it might be a looker but uh, it's definitely going to get treated better than the everyday gun, but it's still going to get shot. Yeah. I, I I have, yeah I, go ahead. I have Brownie BL-22 here. That's a six hundred and fifty dollar gun for a twenty-two rifle. That's pretty <laughs> expensive. And the day I brought that thing home, I took it out of the box. I was looking at it, and I turned and I whacked that thing up against my desk and put a big ding in it. Why? Man, I was heartbroken. Oh, it was accidental. I thought you intentionally like. No, I had, no, I ain't, I ain't one of those guys. No, I won't intentionally oh, okay, scratch okay. something. Yeah. Uh, and now I get to look at that. The gun stands beside me here in my desk, and I get to look at that, and that scratch in it is what I see first. But you know that's life, guys. Yeah. If you handle them, odds are they're gonna get marks and stuff like that the thing is is um i always had this philosophy that uh if you were to buy something and you intend to use it the way that it's supposed to be used that's and you know i i bought a, a toyota supra in order to drive it like a sports car i took it to an autocross event and i beat the shit out of it and, or sorry sorry you know i i mm -hmm. ran it through its paces and it and it wasn't until like a week later that it just kind of blew the engine. But uh, that's. But I drive things that are made to be driven like that. You know, it's not like I buy, uh, a, say, the same year Toyota Supra and just let it sit in my garage because I don't want to take it out because they're rare. Like, no, I. Same thing with these people that buy Ferraris just to say they have a Ferrari. They buy it as a status symbol. They never. You never ever see somebody who 
buys a Lamborghini or a Ferrari and drives it like they're supposed to. Now, the only thing I'm going to say, Wag, is I do have that 95 Civic Si. I bought it purely as an investment, so that's why I'm keeping it original. Yeah, and then, you know, you but it still it. gets it still gets warmed up and driven. But I mean, it's I don't freak out if it gets rained on. I don't freak out if it gets dusty. You know, it gets cleaned up. But I mean, that, I see what you're saying. I mean, I I bought mine just as an investment because I see it being worth something at some point down the road because they're rare. Um, see, I buy I buy firearms for the enjoyment of the fire. There's there's a couple yeah. of guns that I bought, and there's plenty of them on my list that I'm gonna buy. I'll take out to the range and plink. A time or two but they're basically just going to be items that i like and i want to keep because i like the firearm you know well, now i have those on my list too this uh, i just bought the uh, 1860 uh colt clone and that i really didn't buy to shoot i bought it to hang on the damn wall i also want one of those revolver carbines uh from that era of design just for a wall hanger I, I, you know i'll take it out and shoot it some but not much mm -hmm. but at the same time if you're talking about a firearm and you get a scratch on it you can get it cerakote you can get it reblued you can get it fixed it's not uh, some people fail to realize is that anything that is a physical object can be fixable with enough time and money obviously but well yeah. uh, unless there's you know that 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 scratch is not a scratch and it's crack, but I mean, that's, that's totally different. Even with a crack, if you get somebody that is proficient and professional enough, they could weld it and basically make that spot completely, uh, like it never even happened. You know, if you get somebody professional enough to weld it, reheat, treat it and recode it. I want to kind of play off of something that Roots and Films had mentioned over on the YouTube chat. He said, hey, I, I love the way that the, the gun looks as it gets that wear patina from going in and coming out of the holster. I mean, that I just think it looks cool on a gun when it shows that it's been used, that it's it was so, designed to be a tool. And I just I just think it looks awesome on, on a lot of guns. You get that start to get that wear and that, that I agree. <laughs> I agree as long as it is natural wear. And oh, not yeah. painted on finish. No, it's not the way kids buy jeans these days that are already cut. No, no, no. no, no. The shelf, there you know? are a ton of yeah. battle worn finishes out there. I'm just like, really? Yeah, I see that Century offers an AK like that that's got like duct tape wrapped around the stock and it's got uh, like dirt thrown on it and crap. And yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, like, that, like that was you have a lot of 1911s, a lot, a lot of metal frame guns, or, you know, even polymer guns that are. I think Glock yeah. makes one too, don't they? Yeah, yeah they it's... make a battle finished Glock from the factory. Yeah. What about the uh, what about the ARs that are coming out now, Cerakoted with a rattle can finish? Yeah. Oh, and it's... instead of just taking a, a can of Krylon and ruining your gun, now you can order one from the factory that looks like you took a can of Krylon to it and ruined it. So and... they're taking they're taking the clothing marketing for teenagers and they're applying it to guns now. They're going derelict oh, no. on it, huh? <laughs> like well, Zoom. That was a big thing about 15 years ago in guitars. Road worn. And you're paying an extra hundred bucks or so to get your guitar to look like it's been beat to death. Give me a friggin' break. <laughs> uh, anything that'll sell, man. I'm telling you, anything that'll sell. So, ah, uh, God. All right. Hey, let's continue with the holster chat. Hey, Calaveras, what works for you, man? What do you do? Can you get concealed carry in the county that you live in, or is it impossible? Yes, uh, I'm in Sacramento County, which is actually probably one <clears> of <throat> your counties actually to get it because our sheriff is actually supportive of it. Uh, as for you said, what holsters? I'm sorry, I was yeah, yeah. What do you do for holsters? What works for you? It's all good. Uh, listen, at this point, the only holster system I have is the Alien Gear Shapeshift, mm -hmm. uh, and I've only worn it as an outside the waistband. Uh, around my buddy's farm, but that's where I picked that up so I could play with different things. Uh, <clears throat> my plan is to use it as an inside the waistband once I get that permit, which is still going to be a few months out because I have uh, I still have to do all the classes and everything else for it as well. As for you know, a comment that Squib made about the speed, because you know, he likes a little flap holster, I think most people... Uh, regardless of how fast they think they are in a situation, if you're in a defensive situation and it comes down to 
how fast can you draw and fire? Most of us, I think, are pretty well. Uh, what's a nice, polite way of saying it? You know, in, you know, in serious trouble. You know, if that's the kind of situation you're you're in. Um, and I don't know how you'd get around that one. Yeah. Yeah, no, just just practice, 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 man. I mean, doing drills and getting yourself Move. in, you know. Yeah. What's get that? off the friggin' X. Move. Pull a gun out while you're moving. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do some do some defensive training courses or some offensive yeah. training courses, you know. Yeah. I'm going to make some people <laughs> mad by saying this, but uh, get – an airsoft replica of the pistol that you have. Make sure that it's easily identifiable, uh, identif identifiable, and go play airsoft. That is a good way to move around and to basically know how your system functions in a high stress force on force situation. And again, a lot of people need to understand you can get airsoft guns that match the size and the weight and just the overall heft and the manual of arms that your standard firearm has. Sig makes them. Block makes them, Beretta makes them. So they're they're expensive. They're hundreds of dollars, but you can't practice year round, say in your garage, in your home if you just want to plink. But again, like AY said, get out there and do some actual drilling, you know, some actual running around and 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 and, and again with airsoft, you know, I think unfortunately there's a stigma that it's kind of a, a kitty game. It's kind of like, you know, the plastic BB guns we played with as kids. In a lot of other countries, it's it's pretty serious business. I mean, there's a lot of oh, it's even run through the woods. Here. I mean, they actually train with real military. Uh, you know, experts and stuff. I've seen some of the videos, and it is nuts the money these people spend on this. But you want I, uh, to condition yourself for the training, you know. <clears throat> I uh, prefer using actual CO2 BB gun. Yep. Uh, if I want to shoot somebody, I want them to sting. <laughs> well, you know, Firesoft hurts. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. Even the cheap ones, uh, they're, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, this, how bad? You know, I've never actually been hit with an airsoft. How does that compare to like getting hit by like a paintball? It it feels like a bee sting, uh, yeah. but it doesn't resonate like a, a stinking uh, paintball. It stings. It you know, you get you know ball. you get hit, but it just doesn't have that resonation, yeah. and it doesn't leave as bad as welts unless you wear and, thin t-shirts like I do. It depends on the gun. I mean, you've got some airsoft guns that only throw two, three hundred feet per second or whatever. I mean, you've got then you've got some models that are very they're hop up or whatever they call it that are very professional grade that'll hit something at seventy five yards. You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, a, a buddy of mine is into the the airsoft stuff, and we went out to the range, and they're like, I want to sight this stuff in. All right, let's go. And uh, what was it? We were hitting. 40, 50 yards, and it was still going through the cardboard. Yeah. Um, I'm like, okay, what feet per second is this? He's like, well, I mean, this one's set up for about 450, 500 feet per second. Yep. And I saw you, like I said, you can spend, I'm not kidding, you can spend as much, if not more, on an airsoft replica semi automatic gun. Right? Yeah. Just, I mean, you can drop the same amount of change on them. I mean, you can. You can get an M4 that's that's three or four hundred dollars. That's an all metal replica gun. Yeah. You know, other it's just it's amazing what 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 the industry does. So I mean, it's something to consider. Or if anything, you know, just just get a gun that matches your carry weapon if they make one, and practice within the home or get something close to what you carry, and you can practice drawing and shooting. And I mean, you're not gonna, obviously going to get the same effect, but some of them even have blowback action on them where the slides move when you pull the trigger. So yeah, my buddy has a 1911 like that. Mm hmm. Yeah, if you go around and look at and a lot of these you can actually, you know, you can buy them on eBay. They're not banned on eBay or on Amazon. They're they're readily available. Go to sporting goods stores. They carry a lot. They've got a our Cabela's has an entire airsoft section. Um, I went to Bass Pro Shops, they had an entire aisle of airsoft guns, pistols, you know, uh, whatever, rifles. <clears throat> so if you want something to kind of play around with, it's not a bad idea. I mean, you're gonna get very similar kind of feel and uh practiceability. So uh so AWAG, real quick, AWAG, holster-wise, do you have any holsters at all that you use that browse um, outside the waistband if you're on private land or on farmland or something, or what What, what works for you? Uh, when I go and play Airsoft, I have a SIG P226 uh, gas blowback that I mm -hmm. use, and I just use a standard uh, Bulldog uh, soft uh, 
top sided holster, basically. Yep. So. Okay. And I uh, can sort of modify it to be inside the waistband, but it is an outside the waistband holster. It's just I have to draw with my left hand instead of my right hand. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, uh, <laughs> I use that to great effect when I play airsoft. So. So what's your opinion, guys? I did a Blackhawk Serpa holster review about, I don't even know how long ago. It was a year ago. I got not hate, but a lot of people were saying, hey, that's a good way to get yourself killed. Those things are terrible. And I agree. I don't use it as a carry holster. I just wanted to try it for, I think it was my Glock 17 maybe. Um, what do you guys think about those, those Serpa holsters that have that retention, the little button that you push before you draw? Because guys were saying you get a rock in there. If that spring fails, do you really want some mechanical part preventing you from being able to draw your firearm? What do you guys think about that? Or are there higher level Serpa style holsters that won't fail, that won't have issues? Because the Blackhawk ones are readily available at Walmart. A lot of people buy them, and they might not realize what they're getting themselves into. What are your thoughts on that? I've got the one. thing yeah. is, is you need the least amount of crap to do when you have to pull your gun out. Yeah. The Serpa though, it it does. It's not bad because if you draw the way you're supposed to and put your trigger finger down the the side of the the frame then yeah. it, your finger automatically lands on the release button. So um, it's not a bad holster. It doesn't conceal for crap. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're very, but, very bulky. Yeah. But I used it to qualify for my carry permit. I mean, we fired we fired 90 rounds that day, and I don't think we ever shot more than two at a time. So, I mean, we we holstered and drew a lot. So, um, so I don't... I don't hate it, but then it's not what I use for everyday carry. So, this is what so we're talking about. You guys aren't familiar with it. My but. issue with with it, it's not the retention. It's not well. I mean, it's part of the retention, but it's not the the rock get in it or anything like that. It's that you have to push inward on a button. That if okay. in a stressful situation you will overexert uh, pressure inwards, and whenever you draw out that pressure inward on the firearm is extremely close to where the trigger guard is. And if you are overly stressed, you, you'll pull that out. You'll, your finger will keep on going in. There is a chance that your finger will get inside the trigger guard and let off around right down your leg. That is yeah. my issue in a stressful situation. Everyday carry, it's fine. Practice, you're fine because you don't have that, that level of stress. But whenever you start getting stressed, fine motor skills become... First motor skills. Exactly. And all of a sudden, that little bit of pressure you're putting on there, you know, oh, you know, it only needs like a couple pounds of pressure. You may be putting 30 or 40 pounds of pressure to where once there's no more kydex, to keep your finger away from your gun, once that's gone, your finger is going to go in and maybe it hits the very bottom of your fr of your frame and, and they'll slide into your trigger guard. And that that's why I don't like them. Now, so, Rusha is saying that he's carried one for over 10 years. He says the key is to not push the button with the tip of your finger, but the pad of the trigger finger. But again, you're talking about a stressful situation. Who knows what that surge of adrenaline is going to do to you when you well, reach for that gun and you're not in 100% control of <clears throat> the well, amount of force, you know. If you practice, you will go down to your um, lowest le level of training. So if you practice and you train that way, it could be fine. But 95% or 99.9% .9 of the people that do have holsters are Serpa holsters most likely don't train to deal with it. Well, and what, uh, what everybody was telling me on the review that I did is they said, no, it's the reholstering that causes the gun to go off. So I don't know what it is about. Maybe it's the no, button. No, uh, no, no. The, the, the button is in front no. of the trigger. I don't see how it's possible that unless it would break off and get wedged in on your triggers, you're putting it back in, say, like on a Glock or something. But because it's trigger guard. It, it, it's, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a false falsality because that okay. that is in that that mechanism holds onto the trigger guard yeah and it's yeah. in front of the trigger yeah i mean I, I guess if you're buying a universal serpa there's a chance that there's going to be extra play there that in my feet i mean because a lot of times they'll list multiple models when you buy those things 
you might buy it and think, oh, it's good, and it might pop up too far ahead. I suppose. I mean, it would take well, it, it, a pretty it, it significant goes off the amount of play. Guard. It goes yeah, off trigger yeah. guard. So let's say yeah. you have a Glock 17, Glock 19, Glock 26, yeah. different barrel lengths. People are like, oh yeah, you can over insert it, but the geometry from the front, the trigger guard to the trigger is going to be the same on all of those firearms. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. It was just kind of weird. Some, I mean, here I thought it was kind of a cool thing. And then, man, people were just, the hate was just spewing on that, on that video. They're well, like, you're going to shoot well, yourself. It, it, you're going to kill yourself. I'm like, how? What? I mean, I get it if it fails or you get a rock in there and it wedges the button or something. But, you know, it, it is the internet and everything. No, I know. I know. I know. A lot of love. A lot of love. Um, just to kind of show off again some of the holsters. Uh, again, I, I love Klinger holsters. This is the, the V3. This one's reversible. And they did send me one to test out for a gun, but I bought several before they sent me a tester. And it was for, uh, they had just put it into production. They wanted me to test it. So I showed that one off a while ago. This one's for the uh, Car CT9 and it's reversible. And you can go left hand or right hand draw. And they do have multiple drill holes on it now for your brackets. You can go flat, draw angle or 15 degree cant. Uh, these are great. These are awesome. I carried three years. I mean, I had one for my Sky CPX2 before I got rid of that piece of crap and got another one. Um, got another a different firearm. Got got another. I was about to say, did you get another like Sky? No, no, no. Got another holster. And these guys, what's cool about these guys make? They'll get a holster into production a long time before anybody else. When I bought a uh, FN9 compact, the FN9CS or whatever compact, there were no other holsters out there in the market at all. When I first bought it, uh, Klinger actually had one. They had just put out about two or three weeks after the firearm was released. So I had that option of getting one for my because it was my concealed gun for a while. Um, and then, you know, for outside the waistband, when I'm at the range, I just want something easy to use, simple. I'm not running drills. If I usually want to have on me in the video, see, I'm either concealing in my videos or again, just the, uh, the uncle Mike special or bulldog special. This is fine for just dropping the gun in and walking around off the range. I'm not tactical training or anything like that. Um, outside the waistband holster, outside the, the waistband holster, I've got the shooter industries. And again, no Sandhills. I have not <laughs> sanded that down yet. But this is an awesome outside the waistband option. These guys make a really cool holster. Very, very beefy, very heavy duty. It's, you know, with my with the proper carry belt on, this thing is just awesome. I could wear it all day outdoors at the range. That's usually what I do if I'm going to be out walking around and so on. Um, and then for inside the waistband holster, I have switched, since switched from the Clinger to the Hidden Hybrid holsters. This is kind of that Alien Gear style, but this one's all leather. And this is my uh, Ruger EC9S. This thing is awesome. I love it. You can do outside the waistband or inside the waistband. And you got some suede on the back with a shirt tucked in. It doesn't rub so bad to the point that I get any kind of irritation at all. And I've worn it all day. I mean, obviously not at my job. I can't. But if I had to, this is what I would use. And it tucks up nice and tight against my side. And this thing is stubby enough that you don't even notice it. I mean, it. and I, I do have flat base magazine plates that I can put on here if I want that tip to disappear. So I'm not printing. But uh, this, these, these, these are awesome. I love this one. And I'm, I'm not going to lie, they did send me this one. This is the first inside the waistband hybrid style holster that I've ever used. And I, I, I love it. If I mean, I was going to go alien gear. That's what my stepdad uses for his carry weapon for his um, uh, PT-111 G2. And they're great. And, you know, he bought his because of the plates. You can get the free plates. Do they still do that? Do alien gear still offer you free shells? If uh, you get a different weapon, send your old one in. If you don't have a shapeshift, yes. The, there is no uh, shell exchange on shapeshift. Okay. Okay. So I, but you if know, you got the older style, nice. yeah. yeah. So that and that's a nice option. I mean, I, I probably should have just got an alien gear in the first place, as but they didn't have the shell for the FN nine C. They might have it now, but they didn't back in the day. That's why I didn't go alien gear. Um, but uh, but yeah, those are all those are all recommendations that I have. I've had great luck with them. And that that black Blackhawk one, you know, it's just something I bought just to test it out and play around with it for the channel. But I've had great luck with them. But I love Clinger stuff. The only bad thing about Clinger. If it's not in production, the you, sometimes the wait is for like four to six weeks to get it because they they'll list it, but it won't be in production. But a lot of the more popular firearms, your 1911s, your Glocks, your M and P's, they have those ready to ship. But sometimes on a specialty model, they'll have it listed on the website, but there's going to be a delay up to a month to get it. But definitely worth the wait. I mean, they're they're awesome. They've got I don't remember what their guarantee is. I want to say maybe it's three years, but I'm probably off. But they do they do guarantee you're going to be happy with it, and they're like 35 bucks. For, for their Kydex holsters. They've got different styles. This is the most minimalistic one that they offer. So I've had really good luck with that. So uh, anything else on the, the holster discussion at all? Oh, by the way, Foos did join in while we're doing it. Foos, do you want to 
want to talk about your channel a little bit? Where can we find you over on uh, GunChannels.com or YouTube? What's what's up with your channel, man? Uh, it's <laughs> it's just foos. Um, I I don't put out videos often. Um, whenever they do, they are competition style. They're just me competition. Um, I do run USPSA production. 95 nine actually 99 percent of the time that's not what i shoot okay. um it's just place uh, my videos are are mostly for me it's i don't have any major content or anything like that it's for me for a, just a different backup of of videos that i have you know it's, it's a it's another backup and okay. if i want you know if i am starting to train with someone or something like that i'll go ahead and send them to my YouTube and be like, Hey, here's my latest instead of sending them a bunch of files. Or if someone is interested, I'm like, here, they, you know, cause you know, you see some of these like JJ Ricasa and Steger or Stoger Steger. And then, you know, some of these guys that are professionals and do it, you're like, Oh, I can never do that. But then, you know, whenever you start talking to someone that you actually know and you're like, okay, here's a, almost 300 pound guy running around shooting like this. I could shoot like this too. So it, it gives it to a little bit better perspective that, Hey, this isn't a professional doing this. This is just a guy. I know I could do it too. That's, yeah. that's why I do that. Um, so yeah. Um, and I, I, were you going to, I was going to ask you about this, your little, your little business that you're, that you're yeah. working on. Is that up and running yet or not? Can you so, give us or, I don't know what you're comfortable talking about. I'll leave yeah. it up to you. So yeah. sport, sports shooters ammunition. It is, I don't, I'm not going to have a website for a while. Um, right okay. now I am specializing in nine millimeter. It's my USPSA round. It's 124 grain, uh, sorry, 125 grain bullet moving about a thousand forty feet per second. So a little bit, I mean, a NATO is the same weight projectile moving at 1100. So, I mean, it's not a wimpy round. It, it's not, but I officially, I am open. Okay. Um, I'm not taking orders or anything yet because I, I just got in boxes that mm. are legal to ship yesterday. Okay. Um, right now, like with getting all of my, my practice ammo and stuff like that, for the first quarter of the year, um, I'm out of brass. <laughs> I am. I have about a gallon of brass left. So, you gotta be kidding me! You had shelves and shelves well, and garages. I, I, didn't? I, yeah. At one you time, get married. There was no room for a wife. There was only room yeah. for brass. What so, so, so I that was 15 <laughs> gallons of brass. Holy crap! Nine millimeter. <laughs> yeah. Um, Monday, I am. Getting in a 55 gallon drum of brass. So okay, that, that'll um, work. That'll work. That'll be fine. Um, so so that that's about that's about 87,000 pieces. Okay. So come Monday, so. I'm going to start cleaning brass like a mofo, and just got a shovel. <laughs> well, what are you going to do after lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. So, so yeah. So, so once I do that, I have another, I have about, about 3,500 projectiles here. I have another 10,000 coming. I have, uh, seven, 8,000, um, primers. So I, I, and I already do have some loaded. So oh once I get everything t together, um, like, gun channels and stuff like that you know I, I have an email set up it'd be i'll if people want some i'll have a price i'll put it up on gun channels um it, it's what i'm looking right now is if by a thousand um it'll be 180 dollars for a thousand um plus whatever actual shipping it is so what I'll probably end up doing is I'll probably add forty dollars for shipping, but let's say it takes you know twenty dollars to actually ship it, you'll have a twenty dollar bill in the packaging as well. Dude, that's cool, man. 
So, uh, people are asking, what is your channel? Uh, what is your channel on YouTube? Can we get a plug over there, guys, on the, the YouTube? Yeah, it, it, it's just Foos. It, it's kind of harder to, like, if you just type yeah. in F-U-S-S. -S, I did. I couldn't find it. Yeah, You're not going to see it because it's f umlauted U S S. Oh, man. I don't know how to type that on a PC. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that either. <laughs> so if you put, like, Foos and then USPSA. Okay. You most likely will see me, um, and uh, the are. image on it is yep. The image on it is this, the, the flaming muzzle as you see right now. Now I'm seeing an AMN Foos forty three fifty. Is somebody jacking your material or what? What? Show that. There's, a, there's an AMN. Is that you, Walther Arms USPA? No, it says oh Nathan Foos Harvard Massachusetts. Oh okay, that's okay. not. No, that's not me. No. Okay, so there's there's somebody out there trying to steal your because he looks a lot like you. Oh no, you're really? looking at that guy. No, that's definitely an older guy. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Poos. Yeah. How much hassle do you have to go through to get the primers? I order them three days later. They're at my uh, door. Primers yeah, aren't easy stuff. Yeah, it's just a normal hazmat fee, twenty five dollar hazmat fee, up to forty eight pounds. I posted a link, guys. Don't worry about it. We're we're good to go. Yeah, I mean it's it's not. Um, I mean the, the company name is Sport Shooters Ammunition. In fact, if you guys hold on, I will show you my. There you go. Logo. I, I posted the link over there on the YouTube side and put that over on the gun channel side. Okay. There well, we go. for your for your for your um, YouTube channel. So th this is my logo. So Sport Shooters Ammunition rolled in Arkansas. There you go. So, just a little yeah. side note. I just got in a box of from mid uh, midway, yeah, midway, I think, that had three tins of primers for black powder, and one box of forty-five or forty-four, forty-four round balls, and this thing came in a box that was eighteen inches by ten or twelve by ten. Fucking huge box. Sounds like a whole Amazon. bunch of them little <laughs> blow up baggies. <laughs> and I thought, good God, no wonder you charged me nine dollars to send the thing here. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's different. With primers, they can't be loose. Um because so a from what I read if you stack a hundred primers on end, it's like, like a quarter stick of dynamite. Oh so, <laughs> yeah, so, so that's why they are, they are hazmat because they are, they are sensitive to, to shock because they are explosive. I'm, yeah. Um, powder you think is explosive powders burns really fast. Um, so, so I bought 48 pounds of pistol powder. That was enough for about 80,000 rounds. Um, and that was one hazmat charge. Like, once I start selling what I have, my the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to buy, I'm going to look into maybe like 100,000 primers. Order. So. You own a fork truck? No, 100,000 primers is... Is not much. What it's, I mean, just the, the paperwork and everything was it did, did was it did it feel like it was intentionally made inconvenient to discourage somebody from getting into what you do? Or not? No, no, oh, good, good. Um, the, the paperwork, as far as with the the ATF and stuff like that, literally, if you have if you have your fingerprints and stuff, paperwork, mm -hmm. twenty minutes, you send it in, you have. ATF visit you to go over some basic rules. Mm. Um, like I also have my FFL 01 as well. Uh, the, to make ammunition, you need FFL 06 to make ammunition or am ammunition parts. Like uh, all these bullet companies and stuff, they are 06s um, because they make ammunition components. Projectiles is a component. So for FFL 06. I have the same thing. It's thirty dollars for th for three years for that. Um, to, for an FFL, it's two hundred dollars for the first three years, and then ninety dollars for every three years after that. Okay. Um, 
So I have O one, so I can I can ship firearms directly to my house now. Haven't yet. I'm thinking about. I'm I'm, I'm still trying to. I, I'm wanting to do it just because you know to do it, but then I'm like I really don't need to, and I need to put money into the business. So. True. So yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Keep us updated and let us know. Maybe make a YouTube video and post it out there, letting people know that that you do have ammunition available. I mean, if you don't yep. put a link to it on your video directly, YouTube shouldn't have a problem with that. Right. So what what it is? It's right now I'm doing only nine millimeter, only a hundred and twenty five grain bullet. That is the load, my USPSA load. Um, do I do I am I going to go like I'm I'm going to experiment with a the same powder charge and go to one hundred and fifteen to see just to see what it'll do. So that could be the next option. And it may be a little bit cheaper, n not much, just because the amount of cost of the projectiles really is, is going to be the only difference. And you're looking at like a half a cent difference. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that actually surprised me is the shipping containers, like that plastic insert and the box. Mm -hmm. You're looking at fifty cents each. Yeah, that, that's that's the thing that kind of shocked me was, okay, how am I going to package these stuff like that? Um, and it takes time putting in there. And I'm going to have everything's everything's going to be case gauged, so it's not going to be um, just off the press and then into a bag or box or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I am going to have like. I do have different prices. So locally, I'm. I know a lot of a lot of you guys aren't locally, but let's say we take and we meet up at let's say Watermaker, and you guys want to buy a thousand. Um, I will have thousand round bags for cheaper, and it'll be it's a hand deliver type thing. But it'll be a one pl one plastic bag with a thousand rounds in it. Um, what? Are you talking about the actual ammo boxes being pitched in? Yeah, the ammo boxes, the that the, with the plastic trays and stuff like that in it. Well, you can get uh, the box with the styrofoam inserts, like you buy at Walmart, uh, for considerably less than that. I think they're well. You also have to think if you're going to sit there and. I mean, I, I, I'm going to try to be somewhat professional with this. So, I, I personally, I just think that looks cheap. So, that's that's how I look into it. Yeah. Well, that's what Remington's doing in Winchester. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah. Anyway, I don't um, know what kind of hassle right. you can print a label yeah. on the so, cardboard box. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I am, I just ordered a labels for for the cardboard box to go ahead and put that on there. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's starting. I have not, I'm officially open for business. I have not sold anything because of shipping. I was going to get with you first thing um, well, as soon as I am ready to ship and stuff, uh, Travis. Yeah. Um, I know we, we kind of talked about that, but as far as the paperwork, really it's, it's not, it's nothing really. Um, I'm still actually the toughest thing about this shopping around for insurance. I still don't have insurance, so that's another thing that I am. I'm very cautious about. Um, I'm not. I don't want to sell. Have too much out there until I do have insurance. Like, do I think one of these is going to blow up a gun? No, not at all. Uh, I, I have a powder check right afterwards, so I know I'm not double charging. Um, so I, I'm not worried about that. It's just what ifs. So I like yeah. there are some people. I'll, yeah, I'll go ahead and sell to friends stuff like that. But I don't want to have you know have a website up and then all of a sudden someone be like, hey, I want ten thousand rounds, and all of a sudden something gets out there and them come back on me and me not have insurance. Yeah, so I'm well, still in know, the process of looking this, at that. In, in, our, in a lot of the firearms manuals, it'll say do not fire, and, and I don't think it's a big deal, but a lot of them say do not fire remanufactured ammo in this firearm. If you do, you know, it's going to violate your warranty. So any of us that buy remanufactured ammunition and shoot it, 
um, you know, that's just a that's just a chance you take. You're taking a chance just shooting the gun anyway. Well, you know, you could you could have it from the biggest companies that produce ammunition can produce double charge loads. Well, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you you do that. I've had squibs where it was just a uh, just primer in it, and I was like. Because I, I know what that is. I, I've shot those. I've made some of those on my old on a different press. Been there myself. Um, but press I have, I have a powder check right station before. If the powder check level is too much or too little, the machine stops. So at least that's that's one good thing about yeah. this press. If, like, because I do pick up stuff off the ground. Let's say there's um, you know, a spider guy in there made a spider web. You know, what which that will go through cleaning. That will go through. You don't even realize how how well those spider webs will stay in a in a brass case. You'll even punch out the primer, put a new primer in through that. You get to the powder, and all suddenly you have too much volume in there because. A third of the case is spider web. Cobwebs, Guess what? Yeah. My machine will stop. Mm. So. Okay. Yeah. No, man. Um, no, that's cool. Yeah, just give me a holler and let me know when you're ready, and I'll, I'll buy a couple boxes and test it out, and then we'll go from there. So. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. Let me know and I'll help you get the word out there that you're making it because it's it's cool. You're getting it going and you're selling it at a really yeah. fair price and. You know, I actually find it cheaper to buy online because if I don't go to the store and buy ammo, I don't buy extra stuff I don't need because every time I go there, I'm picking stuff up, throwing it in the cart, you know, just to go get a box of ammo or whatever. I'm, you know, I usually try to do it. I usually try to throw it in when I get groceries. I'll get the ammo. But sometimes you go out there for a couple boxes, eh, get some CLP, get some targets, you know, oh, what's on clearance? Eh, maybe I'll take that gun home with me, you know. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's why I prefer just to buy online when it is possible. Plus, you see them on sales tax, too, in Nebraska, which is a nice thing. Yep. Yep. Uh, sales tax and um, uh, let's see what else. Um, well, on your price per round for the round that you're getting, you're you're definitely below what a lot of the other companies charge. So I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 a brass case. Uh, the stuff like that, that ammo that I'm going to be buying, or the the brass I'm going to be going to be buying, it was the brass. I was talking to the guy and. He's like it comes off of police ranges, so it is mm -hmm. true once fired. Okay, um, I am starting to look into government li liquidation sites mm -hmm. as well because you could get brass quite a bit cheaper. Um, it is an auction site. There's a few more hoops you have to jump through, but um, I went ahead and tagged one just to see what barrel will go for. Um, so, but I mean, and, and there's going to be a little bit more processing because, um, like in the government auction site, it says, you know, this may have some blanks in it. Well, I'm not going to reload a blank. <laughs> so there's going to have to be, there's going to have to be a little bit more processing. for um, I, and, I, and I don't know what that additional processing will be. Uh, before I forget, CloverTac wanted me to tell you to check with the Hartford for insurance. The Hartford, if you've called them before. Uh, I, I have not. Okay. Um, like I, I'm look going to be looking at the GSSF. Uh, I'm also going to be looking at. Um, I really don't want the NRA stuff because I don't want to give them any more money. Yeah. Um, so I want to look at the GSSF. So yeah, I, I'll contact the Hartford as well. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Over. Cool. Oh, we were just giving you some winter driving footage from uh, Sandhills. Our, if I look out my window, it looks identical. Why well, can't look out the basement windows here? Because they're kind of uh, we, covered with snow. Uh, <laughs> we, we had tornadoes here last night. Oh, like, fun. fun. And, yeah. like, you, you're talking about Clanger holsters. They're in Van Buren, Arkansas. I think they got hit with two last night. Oh, man. I was just going to say, Travis. I'm going to jump out here real quick and go on yeah, in and start the work day. So thanks for the invite. And uh, yeah. any, anybody that wants to come join us Tuesday night, 9 o'clock Central on 2A Tuesday, you're always welcome. I will be there this Tuesday, Travis. man. Awesome. Sand Hills. Right. What's that, Tony? I said later. All right. Later. Have a good one. Take care, man. See you. Laters. Um, all right. So I think we covered the holsters. I think we got that taken care of. 
let's move on to home security 101. The viewer request was, can you tell me how to uh, make my home more secure without getting into major physical modifications, you know, short of putting bars on the windows? Let's 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 start off with the very basics. OK, we know having a gun in the home is, is fantastic. All right. Let's let's talk about things that you can do to make your home more secure. What are some smart things? People do a lot of stupid things. Uh, Aside from the fact that they put on Facebook, oh, going off to Disney World next week for yeah. a week. You know, wow, what so, a great way to announce to the world that your home is there and it's for the taking, you know. So, so I'm curious thing, what yeah. first thing about this, um, at night, make sure there is a light on. So if someone is inside your house, someone outside your house can see if there's a burglar or something. Um, don't have your house, your yard littered with shit. Because if you have a lot of stuff out in your house, it could be inviting for someone. Um, I don't well, think you let's have anything. Talk, let's, let's talk about door locks. When you buy a house, change the door locks. No, I, I, yeah. I, no, no <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, talking, yeah. I'm talking about uh, before, hmm. before that, before a perp even gets to your front door. Okay. Discourage them. You know, have have outside lights. You know, that, that's what I meant. Outside lights, not not like oh, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of inside lights so you can see everything I own from the road. Yeah, yeah. No, have an outside. Have, 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 have outside lights, mo motion lights, motion. stuff motion like lights, that. Yeah. So, so if someone is coming close to your house, you deter them. Make sure you don't have a whole bunch of crap laying in your yard because if you have a lot of crap laying in your yard, you're gonna have a lot of stuff in your house. Act, you know, act like your house is minimalistic. Uh, deter. That, that's how I do it. Before you even start talking about locks, this locks that. Yeah. Keep your garage door closed, please. Yes. <laughs> well, even if you're just doing a quick little trip to the corner store, put the garage door down. Because you'd be surprised when people just walk right up and ride off on your bike or walk out with it. We've we've had an incredible number of things stolen in the tiny town of ten thousand where I live ridiculous amount of theft happens in the summertime uh, and a lot of it's people leaving their garage door open somebody walks in and walks out with their toolbox well not, not only that but you know? how many people lock the door going from their garage to their house like i do, I do. <laughs> well, I, and the garage door but a lot of people just you know just a lot of people, unlocked, you know a lot of people don't and get into the habit and then oh i'm just running to the store and all suddenly you're gone for an hour and your garage door is open and the door from your garage into your house is also unlocked uh some of the stuff that's also brought up in the chat that's for because i'm gonna have to jet out here in a few minutes no, that's cool, man. Yeah. if i can yeah. uh some old tricks that i picked up from you know the construction side of my family uh sean mentioned it out in the chat as well but that's where the screws that hold your hinges to your house for your door Mm -hmm. Usually aren't very long and aren't very strong, and the you know uh, striker plates you know that you're on the other side that your door latches to, mm -hmm. usually are held in by very short flimsy screws. Uh, so just you know even with the basic door basic lock, if you take the screws that are closest to the center line of the wall, you know uh. A good way to do it is you take a drill bit the same size a diameter as a three inch deck screw. So you uh, drill just a little bit so that way it takes the, because you've got a one by four frame that's actually your door is mounted to. So you drill the wood out of that so it doesn't catch that wood. Then you run the three inch deck screw through that hole, it'll catch your two by four stud behind it, which should be a doubled up king stud, which means it's two two by fours directly in contact with each other and you do that in all of your hinges that'll you know make that side of your door much stronger much harder to knock in yep and you do the same trick on your striker plates on the other side you can take a basic door basic lock set and do and do that and you make a much more robust so instead of them just being able to break a one by four piece of material mm -hmm which is easy to do. I've done it. I've thrown my shoulder into a, you know, a, into a quote unquote security door and blown the frame out before. Um, they essentially have to either buckle the door 
or they have to, you know, a sheer, you know, three inch deck screws before they can get through. So that right there can make a massive difference and it makes no outward look difference to your house. Um, yeah, so that's that just kind of beef it up those screws. That's a big one right there because that's, you won't kick through that wood, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's where with, you know, uh, unfortunately, so many contractors, when they install a door to make it easy on them, they have the the, frame, the hole is framed oversized and then they put the door right in the middle of it, shim both sides of it because it makes it a lot easier to true up the door that way. Uh, the way my family's always done it is we frame the hole only slightly oversized and we actually put the hinges um, tied up against the studs. So that way, that side doesn't give at all, and then we, you know, anchor the other side the other, you know, the way I was describing. Um, trying to break into one of the doors that we've installed, you would have to buckle the door. It would not be an easy thing to do. Uh, yeah. As for locks, a uh, on deadbolts, you have different length throws, which means you know uh, when you click it, how far does that pin mm -hmm. stick yeah. out? Yeah. A uh, so you can put a longer, depending on you know what your you know house has currently, you can put one in with a longer throw, so it will catch more of the wood, you know, which will make it harder for it to then break out. Because if it only catches a little bit, then it's just going to chip out the wood easier. Um, yeah, so having a double pane window is mm -hmm. much harder to break than a single pane, which you know not only is it more energy efficient, it's also more secure. Um, I mean that you know. There's just kind of some basic things like that you can do that physically make it more secure. You know, yeah. but I have to agree with Foose that making your house look like there's nothing worth going after is definitely going to be your first step. And, and a product that I use, um, I actually use it on my cars. Is it's it's a product from 3M. It's called Shatter Shield. Um, basically, it's a type of polymer. Uh, I don't know what the specifics are on it, but it's a completely translucent polymer that you put over your glass. And you could go to town on this piece of glass, and it will not go all the way through. Sure, it'll break the glass uh, behind it, but it nothing will get through it. Nothing. I've seen demonstrations where people... Uh, where a company that outsources it, I guess, to like Russia or something, put like the equivalent of like ten million dollars cash into this this glass box, and <laughs> they only put that shatter shield on it, and they say, "Hey, if you can get through the glass, you can keep the money." And people are going to town on this thing, and I'll back my Jeep over it. Uh <laughs> yeah, and, and people are not getting through it, and it's yeah. it's pretty inexpensive. So I use it on my car windows. Um. The, basically deter people from breaking into my cars. Okay. Current you know, so is your best thing. That's where you need the recreational nukes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We're going to nuke them. <laughs> you break this glass and nuke goes off. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Everybody suffers. <laughs> so, okay, we got the idea. Okay, so reinforcing the, uh, you know, your hinges, your lock points, your strike plates on the doors. Always a good thing. Uh, Obviously, you know, change your locks when you first buy a house just because you don't know who's got the spare keys to it or if it's been changed or not. That's the first thing we did is we put some security grade door handles on all the doors in the house. Um, you know, and again, the one kind of rough area could be glass, glass on that front door. You know, if you've got just a screen door and then you've got like a four pane, you know, glass window on your door, somebody could smash that and unlock it. So your locks aren't going to matter for anything if a person can get their hand right through it. So that's something you got to kind of watch out for. Uh, if you're talking about being gone for a while, like yeah. a vacation or something, yeah. uh, you could put hasps on and padlocks. And like your garage, you can just drill a hole in the garage door track and put a padlock through that. Ain't nobody getting that up. They're going to yeah. tear it off. Uh, windows. Also, yeah, well, I was going to say windows. You make sure windows. they're locked. <laughs> a, a piece of broom handle tall enough to just breach the top so you can't physically open the window. They will not open the window. 
on a, with just a you know fifty cent piece of wood, you can put a stop to that. Yeah, you'll have to break it to get in. Uh, somebody was talking about Gary. Was that you talking about the patio door? I know my grandma. They put a, a broomstick, yeah. cut a broomstick in the sliding door, so you can't slide it open. You couldn't wedge it open. You'd have to bust through the glass to get in. Right, which, but it wouldn't you know, be hard to bust the glass. So no, well, I mean, I God, do you think of the chance that you? I mean, I guess if you used some kind of a blunt object to do it, you know, it, you could probably get in. Um, hammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a hammer. But I mean, the falling glass. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Locks keep honest people honest. If they're willing to smash windows and this kind of stuff. They're gonna get in one way or another. Uh, like look at some of these. You know, talking about you know uh, middle you know, without having to have bars on the windows. Look at some of these security videos we see of, especially at gun stores that have the heavy metal cages and yeah. build back a truck right through the window and then take what they want and drive out. So, I mean, if someone wants you bad enough, there is nothing you're gonna do that's gonna prevent them. Yeah. Short of going full James Bond, if they break this barrier, the entire house vaporizes because it's got eighty pounds of you know, syntax spread throughout the house. I mean, <laughs> you know, well, they had mentioned they had mentioned dogs. Um, I I kind of get a kick out of some of the dog videos on YouTube where they say, "What does the dog really do to an intruder?" Have you ever watched any of the videos on YouTube? They'll have people. They'll have they'll do a simulation where the owner will start screaming and panicking, and somebody like breaks into the house, and the dog like runs out the door and leaves the owner. So, I mean, I guess it depends on the kind of dog you have and how you have it trained. You know, obviously, uh, if you have yourself a nice, a nice defensive dog, an attack dog, uh, you know, Rottweiler, Pitbull, and so on, or even a bigger dog, Doberman, something trained to attack on your commands, that would definitely be a good security system. A barking dog, you know, if somebody's going to break into your house and there's a dog barking, making a lot of noise, they might walk away. Unless, like you said, Calibers, unless they really want to get in your house to get something, they will do what they have to, unfortunately, to get it. And number one, if they um, really want to get in, no matter no no amount of security yeah. is going to keep them. So dogs, probably yeah, a, now go ahead. Go, go ahead, Tony. A dog that uh, will bark at strangers is probably about the best defensive thing you've got aside from living in a concrete bunker. Hey, hey, who's going to want to take the chance that that dog isn't vicious? Yeah, and, and like have a ch little chihuahua that they can't see because those are the sound meanest sounding dogs ever. Oh, they're vicious little turds. Yeah. I'll tell you, the best I ever saw was a chow. Oh, yeah. I heard those guys are, I heard they're, they're, they're like one of the most aggressive dog breeds that are out there. And you wouldn't think it looking at it, but supposedly they are, they're pretty territorial, man. Yep. Um, Somebody was saying, what about, what about ammo dog? What about our little Corgi? You know, think about a Corgi. It's basically a full-size dog with half-size legs. He's got a very freaking loud bark and they're herding animals. So they are used to, now our little guy is not very noisy. He doesn't make a lot of noise unless somebody comes to the door and, you know, we're kind of alerted to it and stuff. But um, yeah, you know, and it kind of depends on the animal and what you're going to do. Uh, but still, okay. So let's, let's move on. Let's move on. So the person's in the house. The person gets in the house. We've talked about what to do to reinforce it, how to keep the house, how to prevent people from getting in, some practical things we can do. Um, the person's in the house. You know, you've got your Brinks security systems. You know, uh, you've got your webcams that you can run with. Oh, uh, what, what do you guys recommend for once they're in the house? You know, alarms. What do you guys think about the home alarms? Um, alarms do things for people who don't really uh who just kind of do that the hit and run kind of deal um they they work uh pretty effectively but if this person is determined to take everything that you have an alarm is just an alarm it's just a noise it's a new unless system. it's one of the systems that's linked up to a call center you know yeah even even um, so yeah. it's how so yeah. that call center depending on where you're at you know small towns they may be more responsive but if you're in a town let's say you know Detroit. How long is it going? They're going to be like, yeah. I got four hours. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing about response time. That's where, and you know, I'm sure it's the same out there in Nebraska as it is where I grew up. You know, a uh, time of year it also can make a difference on response time because uh, that's where, like, my dad's place nowadays response time averages about thirty minutes. At one time, you know, uh, like. 
during the winter res- expected response time at my you know, uh, out in that town was about three hours during the winter. So it's just, you oh, know, yeah. they come in and, you know, <clears throat> fill out some paperwork for you after the fact, but that's where, uh, yeah, like I said, you know, noise is just noise to the determined guys, but that's, you know, See, oh, once yeah. they get in, I don't know what you can really do in, about it. In the town I live in, the small town I live in, the, the response time is probably five minutes because the, you can get from one side of the town to the other within five minutes. I've got a police officer that lives a block away. The police department is four blocks away. It's basically in the center of town. So the response time out of town, when stuff happens in the country, that's 15, 20 minute response time for a sheriff to get out there like an accident on a country road. But in town, it's not where I live. It's a small enough town that it, it's literally five minutes because we've, we've got, called, I've called the police before on non-emergency calls and they're there within 10 minutes when we've had vehicle break-ins and stuff like that. So it, that's one nice thing about being in, in, in a small town is depending on the size of the police department too. Uh, but ours is pretty, usually get two officers that'll respond within five minutes. Mm-hmm. What what I have here in small town Illinois is uh, when our local police department is not on duty in the car, the sheriff is who gets sent out because they don't call the local police. They'll put it out on the radio. And if the cop ain't listening to the radio, he doesn't know shit's going on. So you wait an hour or so for the sheriff to finally get here. Yeah. And what I... Uh... What I use with um, if somebody is already in the house, it, it would be a good thing to have a camera set up inside the house so you document it. You know, it's it'll go over a lot better with um, your insurance company if you have documentation of everything this person stole. You know, if they end up getting away, which most likely they will get away. Yeah, and uh, here I'll, these are the cameras that I use. Um, they're, you can get them on Amazon for like 25 bucks a piece. There, uh, there's an app that goes with it that they start recording 12 seconds of, um, of video when they detect movement. I have them outside focused on my cars. I have them, uh, inside my house focused on points of entry. Um, you know, um, you can record sound with them. They have an SD card in them. You can record through, um, the app which will put the reco- uh like it'll put that video on your phone uh you can get alerts for if they detect movement on your phone um and from there on you can either end up um you know taking that that video and saving it to your phone or you can have an sd card in the camera itself yeah um i have my camera set up that even if the power goes out and the Wi-Fi is down, it will record from that point until the memory runs out on, um, because I have these set up on a, a little battery backup system. Yeah. Um, it'll record until that memory card runs out, and I have them set it like uh, 720p. Yeah, they can go up to 1080, but I have them recording on 720 because they're short range and don't really need to pick out super. Your memory details. card would last longer too. Depending oh on yeah, each each of my cameras has a 64 gigabyte uh, SD card, so okay. it'll it'll record for quite a long time. Uh, just I want to talk about security systems and what I have. We've got a, a Nest system here in the house, and we'll talk about it for a second because there's a lot of high fluid and high tech systems that are coming out. So. <clears throat> the Nest system, you have a base unit, and uh, it plugs into the wall. Okay, it does have a battery. It'll run up to 12 hours on the battery. Um, it is hooked up to your Wi-Fi system. It does have door sensors that have batteries that last, I think, two years. And you can also set it up for webcams. It's compatible with all these different companies and door and window sensors. So we've got the motion sensors in the house. The base unit itself is a motion sensor, and it is set up for pets. So anything that's under 35 pounds, it won't set the alarm off. However, it does it, it does it. And what's cool about it is you've got the siren. Now, Clover made a good point. He says, what about these that have an earplugs? Uh, this does have a, a, an ex- a loud siren that'll go off once it detects the doors being open. When the doors are open, you've got 30 seconds to put in the punch code to, um, to turn the system off, okay? Uh, now, you may say, well, what if they come over and just unplug the unit? Well, it's got the battery backup. What if they turn off to the power to the house? The Nest unit also has a cellular con- connection for five bucks a month that once the the wi-fi is detected as turning off it then sends everything through the cellular network to your phone 
So with the apps on our phone, it'll tell us, well, it, you got a complete record of when the doors have been opened and closed, who did the opening and closing. You've also got tags you can use to turn the system off and on. Um, you've got a silent exit mode where you can push the button and leave. I'm just fascinated with this thing. Now it costs 400 bucks, but the service itself is completely free unless you want the cellular system. So here's the deal. If the unit gets pulled out of the wall and the unit gets stomped on and gets destroyed, and it's not sending a signal anymore. It'll send a message to my phone that says the system has been deactivated or the system has been taken offline. And if I know nobody's supposed to be in the house, I could then call the police department and say, my alarm system is not online. The power's on in the town. Yeah, I need somebody to go check my house. And, you know, obviously you run into situations where the cops can charge you for so many calls and so on. And I haven't had to do that yet, but it gives me a little bit of peace of mind. It's about as good of a system as you can get. Now, the only catch is you have to be near your phone. You'd have to be there when that alert goes off. You can set it up to email whoever you want. Um, you can also pay for call center access. It'll also link with Brinks. So if the system is taken offline, they will call your phone. And that's like another 10, 12 bucks a month. So for 17 bucks a month, you get the cell service and you also get the Brinks link. So they will call your phone and say, hey, your system's been deactivated. Do you want us to notify law, law enforcement? You know? So I mean, that, I mean, obviously a, a good dog is a great thing to have. You know, locks are the great thing to have for us. I see that as the best system I could possibly have for the house that we have with the motion sensors turned on, with the backup for the battery, the backup for the cell. You know, gives us peace of mind when we're not home that the house is as protected as it possibly can be. Um, I will say this, please make sure you've got homeowner's insurance. Make sure you've got some sort of renter's insurance. There's so many times you hear about people getting their apartments broken into and they have no renter's insurance. Renter's insurance is, I think it was $120 a year when we were renting. Um, homeowner's insurance is 200 for us. You know, we still have, you know, it's, it's about 150 a month for homeowner's insurance for us, but obviously that's a much bigger package. But uh, Foos, what were you going to say? Renter's insurance is cheap. It is. And it might have, it, it, it might it, have a, you know, it might have a deductible. Well, I mean, literally, like my rent, my home insurance is 500 bucks for the year. Yeah. It's, it's cheap. Yeah. Do it. Get it. And then also get a, get a rider on your firearms because our homeowner's policy only insures our firearms up to $800. So I've got extra policy. I've got extra coverage and rider coverage on all the firearms in the house. Um, another thing I do to protect the house, and this sounds really, really obsessive compulsive, but once per year, and I've got this set up now, I've got a photo bank of all the items in our house that are worth anything, the TV, the game consoles, the computers, the firearms. And I've got pictures of the serial numbers of all the weapons of the TVs. Cause the first places your TVs and game consoles are going to go, are going to be the pawn shops. Um, you know, people just take it, hawk it, sell it, run off with the money, or they try to sell it on Facebook, uh, Facebook local classifieds. So go through and take pictures of all the property in your house. If you have a total loss, obviously, you know, you'd probably get the full amount they're going to give you, but say a gun gets stolen, you know, it's nice to have that serial number on standby. So if anybody tries to sell it or comes up in a crime, you could, it could be reported as stolen. I mean, the digital camera, it's really easy to do this. And then all I do is take that. I take that file and I put that on. I've got it on a couple blank DVDs because you can store a lot of photos on the DVD. Then I've also got it on a memory card. I've got the pictures on a couple flash drives. I have one with me all the time. I have one up in my classroom. I have a copy of my property. And then I also have a copy with my, my uh, grandparents. They have a copy at their house too. And they're in their safe. So we've got the property part covered. So you need to be, you need to think about that because if something gets stolen, it's you versus the insurance company on what that thing was worth that was taken from you. You might say, well, my 65 inch TV was stolen. Okay, well, what is it? Well, it was this particular model it had all these features. Well, the average 65 inch TV is worth this. So we're going to give you this for it. No, I had this model. Well, where's your proof? You know, not that I've never had to deal with any kind of situation like that with insurance companies. So I don't know how they are. If they're very picky about giving you the money back, usually you've just got that deductible you pay and then they give you the money back for uh, a comparable item. So. I don't know. What do you guys think? Any any thoughts on that at all? Have you ever had to deal with any kind of homeowner's claims? Um, well, for, or food, like for Foos, if his Makarov ever gets stolen, I have a pretty good idea of where it ended up. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. No idea what you mean. <laughs> I have a um, I have a micro SD card uh, that I put a list of two pictures of each firearm that I own, the serial number, the um, basically the number of um, ammunition that I have. Um, and that list is on a micro SD card. I keep that in my wallet. Um, 
and anything else other than that, you know, I'm just going to kind of chalk it up to, you know, just the, whatever the insurance company gives me. Because in New Jersey, uh, normally, if you um, end up having a gun stolen from you, it's probably going to end up in either Camden or any of those other high crime areas. It doesn't end up in a pawn shop because most of the pawn shops here in New Jersey uh, do not have FFLs. So there, it's oh. probably going to end up on the streets. Okay, okay, I didn't think about that. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, and again, you know, that's just it. It's, it's it could end up on the street before. Um, and again, it's always good to have. If you, I would recommend. I you know it's not always required in every state, but maybe keep a record of who it is that you sell firearms to. If you do any personal sales, because in Nebraska, it's very easy to do personal sales of both handguns and rifles. Uh, you just, you know, there's certain rules you have to follow, but it's good to have a record of who you sold the gun to. Mm -hmm. Just you don't run into a situation where you might have to prove that you weren't there when that gun was found on the scene. Yeah. So what, what what I do with the sales of firearms is I ask the person who bought it if I can take a picture of their driver's license um, to prove that they're an, Ar an Arkansas resident. They can. Mm -hmm. I said you can blank out your address and the actual driver ID. That's fine. I just need to have a picture of your name. You, yeah. have you and your name. That's yeah. all I care about. And then what I do is I take an email it to myself. So I have a date stamp on an email of when that was sold. And I in, in the description, I'm like, Ruger SR9. And done. Yeah. No serial okay. number. No, no nothing. So they're like, oh, yeah. We have a Ruger SR9 that was committed, you know, well, let me go. Oh, this is the person I sold it to, and this is the date because this is when I got an email from it. Mm. So you know exactly because if you just have a picture or something like that, if it's if there's no timestamp or anything with it, when was it taken? How, yeah. do we, how do we know that wasn't, you know, whatever? You know, then suddenly it's where were you at this time, you know? Mm -hmm. So, all right. So AWAG is dropped. Thanks a lot for joining us, AWAG. AWAG, I do appreciate it. Uh, Calaveras, I didn't get a chance to, I've been looking at the chat and looking at all kinds of stuff. So Calaveras, thanks for joining in. So, yeah, I mean, it is, it is a good idea to be somewhat responsible for, you know, for what you're doing for your sales. And, uh, it's just good to know. I've, I've had a situation come back on me where a firearm that I sold many years ago was used in a crime and it was, it was confiscated at the crime scene. Police showed up at my door. Who'd you sell it to? Uh, <laughs> let's see, 10 years ago. Wow. Um, you know, so it depends on the situation. So um, that was kind of freaky. Didn't expect that to happen because it, you know, had been sold and it was sold to somebody else who sold to somebody else, ended up using it in a robbery. So, you know, that's kind of a, not a fun situation to be in. It's just a pers personally, somebody who's gone through that, you know. Now you do have that protection where the law says you don't have to have a record in the state that you live in, depending on the state that you're in, Nebraska, you don't have to keep the name of the person that you sold the gun to in a private sale, but if it comes back on you, you know, I mean, it could be used against you. So you got to think about that. So let's keep that in mind. I would finish the topic out with a tip I got in the first batch of training I went through to work for the government. And they said the hardest stuff for a thief or somebody, a burglar, to get around is the stuff you make up yourself. For all the yeah. store-bought stuff, there's people out there that work that stuff out as soon as it's made. Yep. He said that the simple stuff you think of is a nail. Yeah, a nail. Just a screw. That is awesome. Or if, if you have a, let's say you have an attic that there's a window up there that never gets open, nail the thing shut. True, true. There you go. You're uh, on the news, Travis. This is the 40 miles east of where I live. Yeah, with the winter storm yeah. starting to roll in right now. And that's not bad, but trying to drive through it on the highway or the interstate. A problem we run into on, on Interstate 80 that goes through Nebraska, people think they can go 65, 75 miles an hour on that stuff. And it's unbelievable. Within the first couple hours of that snowfall, we've got 20, 25 car accidents that will happen. Or they try to pass and they overcorrect. They hit the shoulder, which is all slushy, and they lose control of the car. I've actually seen that happen in front of me several times on Interstate 80. So uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's fun. And they're talking about Nebraska, which is, that's, that's 40 miles east of where I live. 
it's doing the same thing outside where I'm at. It's pretty much the same situation for Sandhills also. So yeah, it's it's getting to get it's gonna be a brutal weekend. It's showing up a lot later than what they predicted. It was supposed to happen last night, but uh yeah, people just don't know how to slow down. It's ridiculous. So uh, all right, yeah. Tony. I was gonna say big enough vehicle, you don't have to worry too much about it. Uh <laughs> no. If people get wedged between semis, it's it's bad. Especially when people aren't paying attention, they run into you and the car runs into them and then no, I don't I, I agree a bigger vehicle, in my opinion, is going to be safer, a newer, safer vehicle. But I've seen we've seen people get killed in full size pickup trucks, Suburbans. I mean, after a certain speed, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's metal is metal, you know, they'll become uh, beer cans. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, we've had people get wedged in between semis and stuff. And pe- I mean, it's bad. Yeah, especially when they're going 75 miles an hour. I mean, that does you ever watch the crash test videos? They test those at like 40 miles an hour and it shreds those vehicles double the speed, you know. But uh, I, I do feel safer in a bigger vehicle. I'm not going to lie to you about that. But still, it's not like I'm going to be driving a smart car down Interstate 80. Or your, or, or your Civic. Yeah, no, that doesn't go on the interstate ever. No, no. That barely sees highway use. So, Yeah, no, I wouldn't. But that that should barely see use. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, I keep it around as a collector vehicle. But it does have dual airbags and side impact beams, but you're still in a tin can. So, heck, even in my Jeep, you know, it's 17-year-old safety technology. I don't always feel safe in that either. You know, no side impact airbags, stuff like that. So pretty much just need to be in a foam ball, I think, to be safe anymore. Oh, man. One That's thing I wanted to mention real quick uh, before we change topics. Yeah, Travis, yeah. You, you had mentioned uh, when you move into a new place, change your locks. Don't don't keep the locks that the builder put on there. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, we lived in a pretty rural you know, I lived on a farm when I was a kid, and the neighborhood that was around was, wasn't a development. It was like a rural neighborhood, and a house was built, and sure enough, the builder kept the keys for the house. And just to give you a little, the builder was probably about 5'8", 135 pounds maybe, you know, uh, five packs of cigarette type of smoker a day. The guy who bought the house was 6'4", you know, 230, ex-minor uh, league baseball player. Well, they didn't change their locks, and sure enough, one night, the builder was standing in their kid's bedroom at oh about 3 God. o'clock in the morning, standing in their kid's bedroom, and the kid woke up and started screaming. And you can imagine what the very large father did to the very small guy when they caught him in his house. So don't don't think that that's not something serious. That that really happens. You have to change your locks when you move into a new place. What, what was the builder thinking? Was he mentally unstable? What yeah, they had. They had a- so, so hold on. I, I've been in construction uh, industry. I know a lot of people that are, are several people that are in construction industry. They are some fuck fucktards. Honestly, contractors stuff like that, dude. Yeah, don't trust them. They, yeah. I and mean, so some are totally legit and everything. I'm not knocking all of them. There, there are some out there that are like, what the fuck? I don't know, that's just people in general. Yeah. Yeah, they had had issues with him at the very beginning with uh, stuff that he was supposed to have put on the house, and he didn't, and some of the stuff that he did kind of crappy, and he had to come back and fix. And so the guy was a real, real, you know, firecracker. You know, he, he thought he was 10 feet tall and bulletproof, and I guess the night that he was in the house standing in the kid's bedroom he, he realized that he wasn't yeah i know if it had been in my house he'd have been swiss cheese well thankfully you know the guy did own firearms yeah but you know he was a really really good guy and i guess he figured you know if i punch this guy in the face a few times and throw him out the front door i don't have to shoot him you yeah. know so whatever well, yeah, whatever whole, reason he chose not movie. to bring yeah. yeah whatever reason he chose not to bring out the firearm I'm glad that he didn't, and uh, the guy never the guy never came back. That's for sure. Well, the, the thing is, in, in that situation, I mean, have, waking up in a kid, you know, going into a kid's room like that, does he yeah, deserve to be switched? Most people would, would let one off the chain in a situation like that, you know. Does he deserve to be switched cheese? Most likely. Yes, I would have shot some bitch dead to save the next kid. That's just scary stuff when they're in your, I mean, when they're in your house, okay, you know, yeah, but when they're in your kid's room, I mean, a lot of people, 
wouldn't hold back. I mean, that guy got really lucky, man. He got a second that, chance at life. I'll tell you that. Forewarning for all you guys that are here and the ones that are listening, even if my door is standing wide open, do not walk in my house. Yeah. Because I always carry. Yep. There's some home security for you. <laughs> and then real quick about the uh, about the dogs. I've got a 10 year old pit bull that's 90 pounds and I got a one year old pit bull that's 90 pounds and still growing and they go absolutely ballistic when somebody walks in my yard but when you get in the house they're puppies they're sweet little puppies so you, the only deterrent for my dogs is when you see them banging against the door and jumping against the window snarling and teeth showing because they're going crazy that you're in the yard if that doesn't deter you and you get in the house then you've got two dogs that are going to run outside the door and take off through the neighborhood while you're robbing my house <laughs> shouldn't tell people that well so, so what you're people smart. people who know people who know my dogs and come over all the time are still afraid so there's no guarantee that they won't bite you but well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. so far everybody who's come into my house has been friendly. There's never been any kind of altercation in my house, you know, a fight or anything like that. So I haven't seen what the dogs are going to do under an aggressive situation. But, you know, it's always it, it, you can depend on the dog to scare people. But you like like I think Tony mentioned it earlier. If it's not a vicious dog when it's in the house, then it's just something that's going to stand there and watch you pack my stuff away. I think Squid was making a PETA video there. <laughs> Adopt a dog. <laughs> Trying to get him to bark on air, but he won't bark on air. He's begging for a treat. I suppose that um, after he's done eating the treat, then he's going to eat the uh, intruder. Play some uh, Sarah McLaughlin in the background. He'll start barking. Get those droopy eyes. Please adopt a bit. <laughs> My oh, old cow. Now, anybody who come in that house that was a stranger, he would bite. We'd have to put him in the bathroom. Uh until this person had been in the house several times. I guess he could smell and tell that this person's been here before or something, but man, he would not let anybody through the door that he did not know. That's the weird thing. If you go to my parents' house, they've got a Yorkie, and that dog will bite you. If, if like, we play around, and I'll tap my mom on the shoulder, and she'll go, ow, ow, and the dog will bite me. You know, yes. if it thinks that you're hurting one of the somebody in the house, it will bite you. Yeah, if if ours thinks that you're trying to hurt somebody, he'll come up, he'll start growling, he'll bark, he'll jump on you, he'll, you know, and you might just be hugging the other person. We had him for uh, probably about a year or two, and we we weren't certain he'd bark at at strangers, but after a while, he got used to if we're in the house, he doesn't need to run to the door and bark to, at strangers. I mean, he'll 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 go to the door if somebody is walking up. But he, he, he stopped barking, but we weren't sure, you know, will he be a good guard dog? Well, one night uh, we had had the power out for two days and, and probably the first night of the power outage, they came into our backyard at 1030 at night. It's pitch black outside. We're all sleeping. And the dog was trying to jump through the second story window to get into the backyard at these people. He was jumping up and, and barking and clawing and he was trying to smash through the window to get at these two guys in the backyard. And I said, OK, we got a good guard dog. <laughs> you know yeah. the chow i had did the most impressive thing i've ever seen a dog do and that's when we'd go to bed he'd go from our bedroom to each of the kids' bedroom continuously all night long uh and it, there was no training the dog he just did it and i sit one night and i watched him and that's what he did his whole damn nights back and forth. Because up until that point, I didn't really like the dog. Um, just real quick, I was corrected. I was corrected by Roots and Films. That was the ASPCA. That was not PETA. I couldn't remember which organization it was, but People yeah. People eating yeah. tasty animals? Yeah, that's pretty yes. much <laughs> Um, potatoes uh, is saying over on uh, lead and potatoes is saying over potatoes and lead over on the gun channel side is saying a lot of burglars will bring a cheeseburger for McDonald's for the dog. You know, you've seen the, the the Hollywood movies where they throw the steaks at the at the growling, snarling dogs, and the dogs take the steaks and run off, and they just go walk right by. 
You could bring a stack of 10 into my house. The dog will eat all of that in the bag in about three seconds, and then he'll bite you. Oh, yeah. There so, you yeah, go. There you get you enough go. time to look around. He'll be like, thanks for the food. And now? <laughs> next. You're <Yep>. next. <laughs> Clover Tack is saying that he has mysterious dog whisperer powers. He's always, he's just the new. Clover, you need to have a channel, man. You need to have the, the dog whisperer channel. <laughs> and they say they, they know that Clover tastes horrible. I don't think Clover tastes like Lucky Charms. I mean, most dogs might like that. So you Magically know. delicious. Sean says he was only bitten once by a dog, a vicious Dalmatian. Dude, that would just ruin your childhood. You go from watching Dalmatian? the Disney movie. Yeah. Dalmatians are biters. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're, yeah they're, and they're skittish. They're skittish. Oh, man. All right. So let's let's move on to the last topic here, guys. Um, somebody just wanted us to talk about our favorite hunts, what we like to hunt and why. Let's just throw it out there. What have you guys had the most fun hunting in your life? Squirrel. 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 Most fun? Coon hunting by far with with dogs or what oh, do you do yes. yeah Tra following coon hounds that yeah that if you've ever hunted with animals before that is a just an awesome awesome experience uh tony is that something you did as a kid or what i uh, had something i did as a young adult okay uh and it is so impressive how a good dog will work Plus the sound of them, the old school hound dogs bawling at night. Just, it is spine tingling, really. Yeah, yeah. It's like the kind of thing you only see in movies, you know, when they're chasing the criminal through the dark, you know. But um, the these days, would be awesome. my biggest hunting is squirrel because I can do that when it's warm. I like how a 44 caliber bullet will get you 44 pounds of venison. There you go. That works good. I'm hoping I can get that in January, too. Well, see, this is my deer season right now, and mm -hmm. it's like, I'm not going out there and sitting in freaking wind and rain. Piss on that. Yeah, yeah, the weather's got to be right for you to really enjoy it, but yeah. All right, so what else is out there, guys? What, so, Squib, you got to enjoy your, your first deer hunt of all time. Is that right? Yes. Cool, cool, cool. Squibby, do you grow up hunting anything else at all when you were a kid or a young, young person? Never, or? never went. I took hunter safety in in uh, junior high in in Georgia, and they we weren't allowed to have a gun in the, in the school. And uh, I went uh, I went squirrel hunting with my grandpa once when I was about I don't know twenty twenty one. Uh, I've I've gone out and run dogs before hunting season. To see how they mm -hmm. um, they'll uh, flush birds or they'll they'll oh, chase yeah. rabbits. Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of people uh, about hunting. Uh, you know, we, where I used to work, the deer would come right up to the parking lot. So my buddy would be out there with his uh, call, and he go, "Watch this, watch this," you know. And he would show me a lot of stuff about you know the, with the deer scraping the trees and all the different. And I didn't understand that there was a whole lot of science to it. Cause I mean, I remember being at a gun show when I was 16 and the guy had these, these sensors, these infrared sensors, and you'd put them out on deer trails and it would tell you when the deer were on those trails and you could figure out what was the best time to hunt. And I go, well, that takes all the sport out of it. But now fast forward, you know, 30 years later, and I'm, I'm the guy that I, if I could walk out on my back neck and shoot one and be done, I, that's, I, I'm not, I'm not about the sport. I don't care if somebody else's, that's fine. But, um, uh, I've, I've had a lot of thoughts about hunting and, and none of it really necessarily negative. I've never been like against hunting. I don't think there's enough hunting to tell you the truth, but, yeah. uh, just, just, um, it was a, for me waiting so long to go hunting and having a good experience on my first, first time deer hunting is, uh, it, it's, it's enough to get me hooked. The thing is though, I realize though that next year I might not see a deer at all. You know what I mean? Or the year after, maybe I can't go hunting because of my schedule or something going on. And there, there's all, all kinds of, of things to, to consider and not to mention the cost. Oh, my goodness. This has cost me a fortune. Oh, no kidding. you there, man. I I bought that, had to buy that Super Blackhawk Hunter to hunt with. Then all the crap you have to have to be within regulations. Deer hunting is a pricey little hobby. I mean, first. overall, overall, hmm. it was worth it for my first experience. I just need to realize that some of the things I've invested my money in, I can continue to use again and again and again, and I could use it for different kinds of hunting as well. 
And the yeah. other thing is I need to be ready for when I go out and freeze my butt off and get wet and mud everywhere and all this crap and I don't see a thing or I miss what I shoot at or whatever it is, you know, uh, that that's, I, I, I think that if that was my first experience deer hunting, maybe I wouldn't want to go again next year. I really got to start looking into uh, apparel to wear when it's like it is today cold and rainy there's it can be expensive but the technology is making some freaking amazing you know not wrong with going out with a good old-fashioned you know a goose down stuff coat and some nice you know insulated bib overalls but i i picked up a uh, under armor hunting coat from a buddy of mine who just didn't want it he wore it for one season i got it really cheap and it's it's amazingly warm i mean i do have a second layer underneath of it but it blocks the wind it supposedly blocks scent um, it's, it's so warm. I mean, I tried wearing it when it was 30 degrees out, 40 degrees out doing some work outside just to try it out. And I was like sweating. <laughs> so it's going to be good for that, that, that winter freezing, bitter, cold season. Um, I mean, I, I, the technology is definitely there to make a really good warm hunting year. If you're willing to pay the price. I have to get something that's uh, water repellent. Mm hmm because uh, that's where I'm, I got warm enough clothes, but I ain't going to sit in the rain because I'll get soaked yeah. and then I'll freeze. Oh, no, it's there, man. It's you just, if you just browse through the catalogs and see or just go to a, just go to a big, uh, you know, a hunting store like a Cabela's or a Bass Pro Shops. You're going to be amazed at the stuff that's out there nowadays. Obviously, do some reading up on the stuff, but it's it's pretty cool. I mean, after, you know, because I'd start off just doing, you know, just, uh, you know, Carhartt coat, you know, insulated bibs, nothing fancy and staying sort of warm, you know, pretty warm. But the new stuff is awesome. A lot of the thin slate and the boots and you can put the hand warmers and the, they've got pouches built in for hand warmers and stuff and yeah i'm looking forward to breaking mine in in january it's going to be awesome uh on it back to the favorite hunts one of my yeah, favorite yeah, yeah. Hunt was pheasant yes uh, yeah but it it just we had severe winters back in the late 70s that just decimated our pheasant population and it's not worth the effort around here anymore. You'd have to walk a hundred miles to probably see two. Where I'm at, we've got some pretty good grounds for it. Um, they, they do have, we've got a lot of NRD land where that's intentionally developed for upland game bird. And so you can go to those areas and you can ask permission to go on those areas. And somebody always seems to know somebody that's got land that you can walk in it. It is, if you can ever do a pheasant hunt, it is absolutely awesome. Especially if somebody brings a dog along with them, pointer, uh, you know, flushes out the dogs. It is so much fun. That's that's just just kind of this connection with you and the animal and the land and just being out there. That makes it so much fun. Turkey hunting is is awesome. I love going turkey hunting too. That's a lot of fun too. That that can be kind of pricey to get into depending on what you're doing. Um, but yeah, turkey hunts are definitely a lot of fun if you ever get a chance to do those. I always said that I wouldn't do turkey hunting because it's twenty five dollar permit here in Illinois. And it so I'll go buy damn thing. Go buy a turkey yeah. for that. Yeah. The experience they dropped calling it. in, calling it's, in the Tom or the they dropped it. They, I'll have to call them in. They, they're yeah. all over forest. Uh, they dropped the price to 15 bucks. So I think I'm going to try to get a permit for spring. Oh yeah. So there's, there's some really good calls that are out there too, that you can use that are a lot of fun uh, to bring them in just, just to see them open up and start walking towards you. And it's, oh, it's, it's an awesome experience. Again, it's a connection with nature that, that it's really hard to explain. Uh, Gary, what about you? Did you grow up in any kind of a hunting home at all, or did you do any hunting when you were a kid? Uh, sure did. <laughs> My dad loved to hunt. Uh, he kept a hunting dog, uh, pointer, oh, cool. and uh, we used to go out and hunt quail. Oh yeah. And prairie chickens, and mm -hmm. uh, occasionally we'd go after ducks, but that was only if he was with his hunting buddy that had the retrievers. They would actually go out and swim in the water, but we yeah, did. Your duck and goose takes a lot of resources. I mean, once you get there, once you get set up for it, it's it's awesome to do it. You know, but yeah. to watch those bird dogs, like when we hunted quail, Dad really trained that dog well, and just to watch him, you know, go out and sniff down the hedgerow and stuff like that, and go on point and just hold perfectly still until Dad would tell him, you know, go ahead and flush him out, mm -hmm. and it was just something to see. It is. It's like, oh my God, am I actually, because you just don't see animals behave like that on a regular basis unless you have them out in the field. You know, it's, it's, it is cool. It's very, and then and the lineage and the training that goes into it and the discipline, it is very awesome. Yeah. So yeah, my I, dad and I love to hunt. I remember 
my first time I ever went coon hunting on my own with my own dog. This dog treed on a cottonwood tree that was about three foot in diameter. And when he treed, he went around that tree bark, biting the bark, and he peeled the bark off all the way around that tree and stripped about a foot. <laughs> I was nice. kind of freaked out by what the dog was doing. I'm like, Damn, you know. <laughs> But it, it was a trick on the dog's part, so he'd know that he wouldn't go back to that tree. That's some crazy stuff, man. Huh. <laughs> that is cool. That's cool. Foos or David, what about you guys? Any any little hunting uh, stories you had from when you were kids or anything? Fun um, or, yeah. The only thing I hunt is Poonanny. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. No, um, you, ever, you ever gone uh, snipe hunting, Foose? You ever done uh, this? I, I, actually, gr growing up, I went snipe hunting a lot. Yeah, because um, if you guys never done it, just give us a call. We'll take you I, out. I've never, uh, I mean, uh, it was a great thing that we did in the Boy Scouts. I, I never, well, I, I did see some. A, a buddy yeah. of mine always caught it, and he never yeah. let me see what it, you know, what it looked like. And I mean, just. Yeah, it, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, you got to be careful because you do it. You have to do it pitch black because otherwise the snipes will just they'll 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 immediately leave when they see you. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you may not realize there actually is a snipe. We have oh, a I snipe know. season oh, we, here we in know. Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There, there is a real. That, snipe. That's why we hunt them. There is. Yes, exactly. That's 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 it. Yeah, but that's oh. not why you direct other people to hunt them. <laughs> but no, no um so my dad um when we were younger he always took my older brother because my brother was older my dad only had uh the plot of land that he was at there's only it was on a um lease so he only had him and his buddies only had a x amount of people that could hunt so if the, so that, let's say there was 10 people that hunted and they had the lease was, or 10 people that bought in and the lease was for like 13 or let's say 15 um, people. Well, whoever put in the most money towards the lease would get the um, extra five and they would say, okay, you could bring your kids, you could bring whoever. And if he didn't want it, it went to the next, next, next. Well, my dad was like the fourth or fifth in line. So if he got an extra person, it was always one, and he always took my older brother because sounds my, like, sound like dad didn't like you much. Well, I mean, <laughs> my, you know, dad, he was like, you know, he didn't think I would like it and stuff like that. And you know, to this day, I'm I'm the big gun guy. My, my brother turkey hunts and deer hunts and stuff like that, and he has availability land where he lives. I, mean, I I do, but I don't, you know, type thing. Um, so Jeez, the whole northern part of Arkansas is timber, but every year on uh, public ground, someone gets shot, and I'm not going to do it. Is mm. that yeah? Northern part of Arkansas is timber, but they're full of fucking hillbillies. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like. There's five of them, and you might have three teeth between the five of them. I'm not shitting you. So, yeah, you really gotta really gotta scout those grounds out. Know just how many people are out there. It's it's. No, it no is, yeah. I, I have friends that are like, hey, yeah, you could totally come out to the cabin, um, what have you. But the thing is, is that's that's where they hunt. That I'm not gonna sit there and. Just take deer off your land. I, I, I'm, yeah. Unless I actually take and work the land, stuff like that, I don't want to harvest because I don't want to take food away from other people, even though there's plenty around here. Um, I, I don't want to take it from them whenever I don't work the land. Chances are you're doing them a favor by taking one. Oh, I, I mean, I, true, but I just don't feel like it's, proper for me to just go and say hey can i hunt and not help with the land and stuff like that and you know they never asked me to help keep up the land I, i've offered multiple times and you know i was like well you know i'll just go down there and 
do something. And I said that to my buddy. He's like, if his entire family owns the land down there, um, the old, there's one road in, one road out. And uh, he's like, if my family does not know who, like, the vehicle, you will have four cut valve stems. Oh, my. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, th th there was a. Yeah. Th there was a a jeep several years ago that he was ta talking about. They ventured down there on accident, had to use the restroom, went and uh, went off not very far to use the restroom. It was a lady and came back and her valve stems were cut. Just for the record, that was not my Jeep. I just want to let that out right oh, now. No, it, it was a Jeep. Right? <laughs> okay. Okay. But, uh, I mean, still, I mean, where I live, it's like if you don't know where you're at, don't go. Seriously, it can literally it's, be a life or death situation. Oh, absolutely. You know, you don't know. Absolutely, I mean. absolutely. Any, there are some areas of the country that they are very private, very you don't know where you're at. Sorry, type thing. Yep. And I'm I, I'm in one of those areas. I actually have a fairly large amount of family down there in northern Arkansas. So I could go down there and there's timber available, but I mm -hmm. just, it's just, I don't want to go deer hunting somewhere else. I don't like deer that damn much. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's like, it's viable. I, I have gone. Um, heck, the last year I had, I was... <laughs> I was on the shitter when I took it. Um, but literally, I looked out and I'm like, there's a deer, a doe, about 75 yards out. Hey, David, grab my grab my Mosin. Uh, shoot, I, I, whenever I do hunt, I hunt with a Type 53. Um, and I answer at my ankles, leaned out the window, which is perfectly legal here in Arkansas, and took it. Let it rip. Just grip it and rip it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Oh, damn. I, uh, I aimed for the neck. Got a neck and gone. Yeah. Didn't move. Well, that pales in comparison to most of my hunting stories, but uh, that is some that's some crazy stuff, man. Hey, yeah. whatever works for you, man. And you can <laughs> break the law, so there you go. Awesome. David, what about you, man? You got any, any, did you grow up in any, you said kind of grew up on a farm. Do you have any, any hunting experience at all when you were a little kid or growing up as a young adult? What, what about you? Well, when I was younger, I'd shoot fox and deer, or not deer, fox and rabbits and squirrels with my BB gun. Mm -hmm. And it, it never killed any of them. It just kind of, I guess it would hurt them because they hit yeah. them and they'd take off running. And then one day I shot a bird and killed it and knocked it out of a tree and cried for about 10 minutes. So I quit shooting stuff, and then I guess the rest of my hunting experience would be fishing. Uh, you know, if, you if, you can, if you can count fishing as hunting. <laughs> well, it's, it's the same idea, you know. Back <laughs> in Missouri, we used to be able to hunt gar with rifle. Mm -hmm. so, so, so something else I used to do whenever I was a kid, I used to uh, pluck cats with BB guns off my parents' car. You used to do what? Pluck cats. Off of my parents' oh, wow. vehicle okay. with a BB gun. I can't begin to count how many cats I've shot. Y'all are just horrible. Well, I mean, don't fall over. Shit. Who's you okay? Yeah, no, I, I'm playing a farm simulating game. Uh. And <laughs> I am I am bailing a whole bunch of hay, and I just knocked. My trailer over. I thought your I thought your Mosin fell over and you're sitting on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like, oh man. Oh man. No. This yeah, is yeah. this is what I did. Oh man. These I spent a bunch of time games, up man. here and then all of a sudden I just tipped it over. Dude, don't let OSHA see that. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna see what I can do. Oh my god. Can you flip that thing back up with your tractor? Farm simulator. Man, I don't uh, have a farm simulator. I'm surrounded by farm simulator. All right, I get enough farm simulator in one day. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> it looks like. Oh my god. Yeah. Get it, get it, get it, get it. 
Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, there you go. Now go out your nephew that you crushed and. Uh, Oh my God! Yeah, so, so I'm I'm on a contract. <coughs> I need to. I, I mowed and I bailed all these. I need to take them to the barn. And I've been doing the entire time I've been on here. I've been trying to f load this damn trailer. So it's gonna take forever. Well, I hope your ammunition skills are better than your hay loading skills because I want to make sure I keep all my fingers on my hand. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh my God! You no, know, I've done all that work. Oh real in real life and i would not want to play a game of it i know it's like that's like i, I would not want to do teacher simulator for my home hey sim yeah. teacher no that's okay i get 50 hours of it every week i'm good enough i log enough hours offline on that so no, it, it, oh, it, yeah. it's just a game that i started that i found and it was like 30 bucks I'm like eh, i'll give it a try it's, yeah. it's 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 okay it's fun but like st stupid shit like this i'm like uh See, I'm about knocked it over that, again. That happens. I need a bigger trailer. A lot more. Uh, that happens a lot more than you might think in real life. Oh yeah. Oh, I know farming is incredibly dangerous. I mean, it's very. You don't realize. Yeah, it's it's it's. There's so many different things that could happen. Whether it's cleaning out the equipment, stuff happens, or things falling, things tipping, car accidents. I mean, it's it is an incredibly dangerous uh, job to 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 do on a daily basis, depending on what you farm. And, you know, hey, dealing with cattle, live animals, I mean, that's another whole other situation, too, when you're dealing with bulls and steers and breeding stock and, and stuff like that, or just the heavy machinery. Oh, yeah, we've had farmers roll tractors get killed before. I mean, it does happen, so. Yeah, I used to drive yeah. tractors when I was in high school. I drove for my uncle during the summer. And uh, those great big old things, yeah, it's amazing how fast they can almost flip over and stuff. Mm -hmm. It almost happened to me. I, I dumped an Oliver 550 on its side. Uh, just hit a hole in the ditch while I was mowing, and yeah. thing just boom, laid over. Yep. My boss sold the Oliver and bought one with a freaking ROP system on it because he's afraid I was going to kill myself. But you didn't. Yep, yep. ROP system is like a roll bar. It's rollover yep. protection. crazy all right guys ah, uh, oh, geez. A... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well yeah. at least boost this shows you maybe this isn't something you should pursue later on in life maybe. oh no <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so my, my dad for a while thought i was gonna be a heavy machine operator i am so glad i did not <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right, guys. I'm gonna go ahead and call it. It's been a it's been a couple hours. Good, solid two and a half hours. We had a nice little chat today. So today, guys, we did talk about holsters, all sorts of different holsters inside the waistband, outside the waistband. Uh, is that NPC meme target? I'm looking at what Root Fan's saying here. I uh, ended up just setting up traps. Took a few weeks, but I got rid of them all. Talking about different things that people were hunting. Uh, we talked about home security 101. Everything from the basics of, you know, keeping people out of the house to making it look like you have a house that people don't want to come into. And then also talking about our favorite hunts and what we like to hunt and so on. So this has been uh, episode number 70. So I want to give a quick shout out to Potatoes and Lead over there on the YouTube. I'm sorry, on the Gun Channel side, who is with us. Make sure you get over to GunChannels.com. Do get signed up for an account. Get over to GunTube.org. If you order anything from Brownells or PSA, please go to GunTube. Click on the banners and order that route so GunTube can get a small portion of that uh, sale of that commission because GunTube is self-funded. It's not run by Google AdSense. Um, and joining us today, we had a lot of people in the chat. I want to thank the panel that was here with us. So Sandhill Shooter, thanks for being here. AWAG, thanks for being here. Calaveras 32 Special was here for a while. Thanks, buddy, for being here, too. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. So over on the YouTube side, we got Black Cat Outdoors that was with us. Jorge Cortez, Sean Newman, Rupan was with us, too. Patreon in the Dark in the house. Uh, let's see. Roosted, uh, Clover Tack was with us, too. Gizzard Gary was there and here. Everybody on the panel was there and here. Uh, Tayuya 700 was with us also. Okay, good to see you here. A few new faces I hadn't seen before. It's good to see all these new people joining us. I think it was what, Scott P79 was one of the first ones here. Move Up was with us. Boob Sweat was with us also. Roosted Films in the house. Uh, hopefully I didn't miss anybody. If I did, I do apologize. Midnight Range was with us. Yeah, was was with us in the chat also. Vandalisco Vlog, Sean Newman. What's up, Boost? Scott P79, is he relative or... 
No, no, just he's in the P series, you know. So he's he could be a cousin. It's a he's not one of the Travi, but he, he could be an he could be a uh, whatever you want to call it, an awarded Travi. We could we could no, 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 he's relative three times removed. Yeah, exactly, exactly, seven point nine times removed. Um, again, Vandal, thanks for joining us, buddy. Sean Pondery oh. in the house. Oh, uh, tipped over. out there. What's that? Tacos and French fries joining it almost, us. It almost tipped over again. You you be careful there, Boost. We need you making ammo so I can get my first order placed before you. Lock your head off there. Uh, local T23 <laughs> in the house. Awesome, guys. Awesome. So that was it, guys. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll have another episode lined up for next week. It should be a good time. I'm hoping I can get a, a few range videos out there. I've got a Ruger Precision Rifle I need to take out. And I've also got my 6.5 Creedmoor that I need to take out. I'll be announcing that in a video here soon. It's actually sitting behind me right over here. You can't see I'm opposite. My mirroring is turned on. It's what there, right there. It's right there. So. And uh, we'll get that out, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Like I said, it's the middle of a winter storm right now, so I cannot get out to the range easily. I mean, if I wanted to get all bundled up, I could go, but it would just be a nightmare trying to shoot. So um, anyway, guys, that is it. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, otherwise, I think we're about to say, why we got Ammo Dog won't do the trick. Rupan, Ammo Dog is going to be just fine. He uh, he tracks rabbits, and he's a, he's a good guy. He's, he's a good little guard dog to have around the house, even though he's just a corgi. So... Otherwise, guys, that's it. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you guys all have a great weekend. Stay warm, bundle up, get out there, do some shooting, take somebody to the range that you know. Um, I want you guys to have fun. I want you to be safe. As always, man, we will talk to you guys soon. Bye, Alicia. Shout out Good to day, everybody. Shout out to being fringe. <laughs> Adios, Felicia. Adios, Felicia. Poor little Night Strike didn't join in. That's right. Maybe we'll get him next time. So, All right. Y'all take care. Have a great weekend. We'll talk oh. to you soon. Yeah, we're going to leave you with a little bit of uh, Foose's driving action here. He's taking it to the market. And uh, we'll to talk barn, to you guys yeah. later. Taking it to the barn. <laughs> All right, you're driving on the left side of the road there, Foose. I, I don't you. care. Okay, good. All right, now on that note, we'll talk to you guys later. Hey, All right. I hate farmers. <laughs> I, have, hey, I have no idea. This may be in England.